I wanted you to, to be able to experience this. This is one of our partner organizations, the Sun Coast State Park. They do have lots of opportunities to volunteer. They have a pollinator garden, they have a nature center, they have um, hike leader positions all available for you to do as an astronaut as a volunteer. Um, Ranger John is our contact here. He's awesome. If you ever get a chance to follow Huntsville State Park on YouTube, um, not YouTube, Facebook, he does some wonderful presentations there. Okay. Today we have Abby with us. Abby is a Texas Master Naturalist with the Hartwood Chapter. She's also an amazing herpetologist. <laughs> and so she's going to lead us on a herp walk, but I'll let her go ahead and introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, teaching is one of my favorite things to do. I used to teach at Tech um, Biology and Herpetology. And so whenever um, I graduated with my master's, I did alligators and their gut parasite flora fauna. Um, and so alligator, this is actually from my master's, but alligators hold a special part and a little part in my heart. Um, we're going to go on a herp walk today and we're going to kind of do the basics of herping. Um, herpetology actually comes from the Greek word herpeton, so it means crawling thing, herp is crawling. Um, and so, and then ology, of course, is the study of, uh, so anything that's crawling, frogs, snakes, lizards, turtles, salamanders. Yep. Um, so we're going to go on a herp walk. I don't know where we're gonna go, um, probably just around this area, right in here around the water edge. Okay, this is the next step, right? Yeah, I think so. So um, I have a net in my car if we need it, but I also have snake tongs. I'm gonna teach you guys how to bag snakes today. Um, we'll do a bagging with a non-venomous snake. That's the best way to learn. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I do have some venomous snakes with me today, so we'll, I'll show you guys, we can tube them and we can touch them and be up close and safe. So that'll be cool. Um, I think my number one rule of, of herping is if you don't immediately know what it is, don't touch it. Um, because it, it's 80% of snake bites happen whenever somebody's trying to kill it or get too close. And so if you see a snake, usually just yell out snake and I'll come over there. But if it's a rat snake, this is a rat snake, a water snake, we're probably gonna see kind of coming off the banks. Um, lots of toads, lots of frogs. If we see a cotton mouth, I will be stoked. Stoked. Mm -hmm. out on that snake table, right? Um, but their their pattern will maybe be a stripe instead of their shit, but they still look the same color, mm -hmm. right? We saw one in the there was one in the meeting the other day, like I was giving a presentation. It was like it took the Hershey's kiss and like the Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, what snake are you talking about? I mean, that that was a copperhead that are just apparent, um, like like an albino or a melanistic mm -hmm. or um, just a different pattern because of a genetic mutation. So it's the Hershey kiss. So white... The Hershey kiss is, is, is typical. That's what. The white tip tongue is that different or any characteristic? Um, or... that's just it's just for, um. Like some snakes have like black tongues, some snakes have red tongues. This guy just has white. Yeah. You know? They're biting. So if you're going to get bit by a venomous snake, you hope to God it's this one. Um, they're probably our least 
venomous snake in Texas. Really? Yep. Um, they typically don't give anti venom anymore. It's more of just like go to the hospital and get fluids for swelling, and that's it. Uh -huh. So you're really not going to die unless you have an allergic reaction to it. Yeah, my neighbor got it. Yeah. And then it came back to normal. And Does an EpiPen work for the snakes? Um, an EpiPen will work if you're having an allergic reaction, but you don't necessarily want to start your heart rate pumping really hard, right? So um, that is, I would is, I would not recommend an EpiPen unless you're having an allergic reaction. I had a, a, a field hand get bit by a rattlesnake when we were out in the field, and he started he picked up a baby one and freaked out and dropped it. And he started waving his hands around and running up the bank. I'm like, you got to calm down. You just got to calm yeah. down. And we were out about two and a half hours out from the hospital. He survived, but his, by the time we got to the hospital, his hand was about the size of a baseball glove. And he had passed out in the back seat. So we kind of like drug him in the hospital. He's fine, but almost got him fired. <laughs> <laughs> so on the hog nose, Hog nose. Hognose. So their rear thing. Then. Correct, but only for frogs. So that 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 venom is really specific for frogs. Okay. If they bite you, which is extremely rare, um, and they do a lot of like mock strikes, right? Mm -hmm. So if they bite you, they really have to chew on you to get a fang in, and they wouldn't be chewing on you unless you're like they think you're a frog. So if you've been holding frogs, <laughs> they're gonna do it. Um, but if if not, they just do the the random strike thingy and it's i think the venom of a hog nose just makes you irritated and that's it there's there's no anti-venom there's no hospital trip yeah so we don't have to be fearful nope uh, it's there's such a culture that's Anti yes. It's like if you find a cup, kill it. So. We are totally going to talk about why it's not cool to kill snakes because it it's it messes up our ecosystem um, population wise. So, but I have a whole thing about that. Anybody else want to touch? Hold. Oh, two and two. Yep. Yep. Yeah. He gets tired. So uh, they they only have the energy that they have the warmth to make that energy. And so after they've spent that energy and he's not gathering sun, he's going to calm way down. Yeah. I found him crawling across my, my front door. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Not by hand with the snake. Yeah, we have king snakes, copperheads. Show my husband. Thank you. my students. Just so the public does. Two and two. Two and two. <laughs> Such oh, we David got bit three years ago. Yeah, so I think in the past, I've still had a snake. Have you been all the time? Just wash your hands. Yeah, I mean the. The rat snake bit me there. Last night got bit by the water snake that we caught. And I just, you just wash it off. It doesn't make a mark really. I mean, you can see, I was showing Calandra this morning, you see his top jaw and his bottom jaw, and he was just like, Meh. Anybody else? It's like a little pin trick. Yeah, exactly. Oh, God. I love that. You are. We have my own company. It's called Living Wild. It's a habitat restoration company. So basically, we come in and we do like pollinator patches, hummingbird habitats. 
Um, it's essentially a landscaping service with natives exclusively, um, but we do more habitat-based gardening. So bird habitats, we've done a turtle habitat, um, trying to make people's yards an actual ecosystem rather than just, you know. Um, that is a star. Yeah, it's a star. Those ones don't bother me. The small guy, I'm going to put next to each because I'm not going to try and just too small. Do you want a picture of you? Yes, there you go. What's your mom going to say? Anybody else? We're good? Okay. Um, so I'm going to put it back in the bag. It's the same, same, same thing. <laughs> she like like she like to come up and rub against your face, right. and she was very affectionate. See, that probably wouldn't burn. Oh no, it wouldn't be as much. Something like that. Wild snakes and I will not go near. I like I like having people in the backyard. Keeps the population. Keeps the rats population. <laughs> You know, there's, right. there's, 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 there's those people who tell you there's good things around you, but yeah, that's the good thing. The good thing is, is that it makes it different. The bad thing is, all right, you have a lot of things that that makes people feel It's the only time we have a living a subdivision, so we're all right up against each other. For some reason, somewhere we had a little bit of rent. I'll go in the bag. It's a place to hide. It's a place to hide. I don't know what it's meant. I haven't seen them since. That's what happened to the dogs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to worry about and he's a copperhead too. He's a copperhead. At the hot corner. Oh, he does a little gone. He's got a green tail. It's a baby. Our little baby. Oh my God, he's adorable. So if you look really closely, you can see his his coddle lure. Um, that's his tail, and it's it's bright yellow. And what they do, they they use that when they're very young to wiggle like a little like worm or something, and a lizard comes along and they oh. grab it. Hmm. Yeah, smart. I thought it was brighter than that. Yeah, right on top of it. Uh, what happens with like invasive, say like that Cuban lizard mm -hmm. that's invasive? Do they also eat those? They will. Yeah. Yeah. So do they compete snakes? So you know. If you got copperheads, yeah, really such you're just gonna have copperheads or so they're they're filling so different you know. niches. So like the copperheads, they like this guy, he loves cicadas. Babies, baby copperheads love cicadas. They hang around like trees at the base of trees where they're coming out. Mm -hmm. Um and they, they love those. So you're not gonna find another snake eating that cicada, right? So he's taken that niche. The cotton mouse can eat the fish, the frogs, because he's not really a water snake. So those guys aren't competing. And then you have the rat snake. He's after mammals. Not so much. He'll he'll eat mammals, but very, very small mammals, like like baby mice almost, right? Um, and so they're they're not overlapping with the competition so much. That was a good question. Racers. 
racers are mammal eaters yeah. and lizard Nine. eaters. Nine. Racers are awesome. I don't know if I have a tube small enough for this. Uh -huh. I love that. Oh, yeah. He is so cute. I might need a, a big large one. Good thing. He's, is he just as poisonous as a bigger one? Yes. Um, they are just as venomous, except they have no control over their uh, venom output. And so that's why people think that um, they're more venomous. Yeah, they're, they're they're more really venomous. But really, they, they just don't have the control over their venom glands that the adults do. So when they bite, they give you everything they've got. Um, and so why do adults regulate their venom size? Expensive. It's really it expensive to make. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's energetically expensive to make. And that's why adults will dry bite more often because they want to save that venom. They, meant, they spent so much energy making it. So it's, it's expensive energetically, like metabolically for them to do it. And so they're cold blooded. They have to warm themselves up to the temperature that metabolic processes can happen. And, and then that is, oh, I lost my train of thought. Well, that, that still has to take time though. I mean, the sun helps speed it yeah. up, but it still takes time. It takes a long time. So like if a, if a, a large rattlesnake envenomated a rat and they not have to eat for another year and he spend that year building up his venom again. Yeah. And then once it was like that, they store it in their plants on the internet. It's, it's prey specific. So when a, when a snake is venomous, it evolved for the prey. But then, like, um, you think about the black mambas in Africa, they have to have really potent venom because of the larger megafauna that's there. And so it's their venom is, it was for originally their prey because it, it was very fast, so they needed to kill it quick. And then as time went on, they evolved into um, having more of a defense mechanism that can take down an elephant, right? They're more hibernating or like in torpor in the winter time, so they're not going to be eating as much. Um, their temperature goes goes down. It's, it's like a really light hibernation. Yes. So they use their venom Almost, that, not at all. Yeah, because they'll be like these guys. They'll be underground, just sleeping and waiting for it to warm up. Yeah. So when people are like they're milking snakes, do they only milk that snake once a year, or how does that work? They will milk it as much as they possibly can. So they'll they'll milk it and and run it dry, and they'll put it in a cage for another couple of weeks, and then milk it and run it dry. And so those snakes are, are always dry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We have one more fun snake. So how many venomous snakes are there in Texas? How many? Snakes? Okay. So in, in our region, we have four. Okay. In Texas, we have about 14 different species. But they're they're hair splitting the species. So this is a certain species of rattlesnake. That's another species of rattlesnake. That's another species of rattlesnake. Right. Um, we're going to cover the big four that we we will see often. Awesome. Um, I think I'll leave this friend in here so we can look at him more. This is an empty bag. That is venomous. So when you say you, they like uh, they rub them dry, how do you? Yeah. They, don't have they they just can't like so whenever have you ever seen them take the snake and they have it in their hand and they make it bite the, yeah. the thing they have their hands on the venom glands right on top of the head and they're kind of massaging the venom glands to make it like right to make it slow yeah slow. yeah so they'll just touch over right yeah so the whenever a snake bites they constrict their venom glands, and that's what pumps it through the, the fang. This is a water snake we caught last night. 
the one that this is yes so it's not what do you mean so water snakes are not cottonmouths water snakes are water snakes oh. hello <laughs> oh. Oh. oh he's busy oh. Yeah. <laughs> he's making fun of <laughs> Oh, yeah. Now, it's the plain belly water snake. Is that what they're called? I've seen the belly. The PBWS. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes, that's it. Yes, he's really close. So, he looks like a cottonmouth. He looks a lot like a cottonmouth. Um, but he's got really big round pupils and he's got a yellow belly. He's a yellow belly water snake. And he's pooping all over the place. That's their defense mechanism is to poop. I'm going to be The stripes are, are pretty indicative that he's a water snake. Um, when you see a snake in the water, if it's swimming with just its head out, and you just see the head, it's just a water snake. If you see the whole body floating on top of the water, it's a cottonmouth. Oh, oh. Question. Yeah. So um, on the golf course the other day, I saw that snake that I grabbed, the blue garden snake. Uh -huh. I physically saw it go underwater and swim under it. Yay! Yeah, they'll do that. Okay. But like they'll dive. This yeah. is like a traveling snake on top of the water. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know they did that. I thought that was so crazy. Yeah, we went to, uh, in Austin, we went to uh, one of those uh, water ponds, whatever, Hamilton Pool, I think it's what it's called. And we saw them swimming underwater. What they, what they do, they'll swim underwater and they make a bow, like a little arc with their um, body and they they fling their, their tail forward and there's fish mm. right in between their tail and their head and they just like... <laughs> <laughs> so that you'll see them kind of like flipping their body around and they're, they're hunting and these are these are specifically fish eaters so no backwards curving teeth um just pinpricks what is pinpricks that's where he bit me last night oh little little like, like needles if you would not not painful at all. I'd rather be get bitten by these guys than the <laughs> family. If you have diabetes and you check for your insulin, that's what it feels like. It's even less than that. Oh, yeah. Little nice big brown eyes. Yeah. And then you can see his face. It almost looks like a muppet. Yeah. I always yeah. think that they look like muppets. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he's obviously not. A cotton mouth, but he does have gosh, he, he's trying really hard. He has that banding that looks like a cotton mouth. So these are the snakes that are most commonly confused for cotton mouths. So that and how are you their their head looks different. The way he was swimming last night, he was underwater with his head up. Um and then I've seen these a lot. So it's my very first big girl job was doing water snake research. And so um, the more you look at them, the more you have a search image, the more you'll kind of just be like, oh, it's water snake. Just inside of his mouth. Is he manipulated with the white inside of his mouth? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Abby, how much water do they eat? How often do they have to get in that water? They, they, I think their their mouth is pretty Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. Um, they, since they're eating the fish that are in there, um, they are going to need to be around the water. They won't be far from the water. You won't find them like a mile from the water. You're going to find them next to a puddle. So they really like to stay in the water. Yes. Their species name is Piscivorus, which is Latin for fish eater. It wouldn't have been. So this is a water snake. A water snake, a yellow belly water snake. Thank you for being here today. Yellow belly or yellow belly? Yellow belly. So would you ever see one of those on a tree lamb or? Yeah, yeah they'll, they'll hang out on tree limbs and sun themselves just like cottonmouths do. 
And so that's a pattern that, but one, if they're in the water, you can't really see that yellow. Right. Necessarily. Right. Which is, so it's, which is it's why based off of the behavior of what they're doing. Oh, there he goes. Here we go. Does anybody have any other questions about water snakes? And we can run through our quick talk really quick. Okay, I'll put him away. I'll go set up that. Oh, no, no, they're strict. They don't need to do it. This one will. I didn't flinch this time. Last night, last night, I was like, close your eyes, Colin. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> too sweet. I'm too sweet. Oh. <laughs> it seems like when you were doing this and rolling them down to the bottom, mm -hmm. that it's it, a little scary, right? Well, it, it, I'm ready. I was thinking for the snake. I mean, like, yeah, the yeah, people yeah. ever like, you know, smash them? And, and what if the snake's body was under there? That's why whenever, you, so whenever you immediately put this down, if you were to, if the bag was see-through and it feels something on top of it, it yanks itself back and it like coils, So you're right? counting on it. I'm counting on it to do that, but I also have the bag so close to the ground that when I pull it, no, no little snake flab or anything is going to get pulled in. cognizant of how it feels. I know you did it fast, but I was like, you could, you could, you could, you could, right. Yeah. Right. No, but that, that, the this bagging is so that, that doesn't yeah. like. Oh, it looks like a gift bag. It is. <laughs> the gift bag. Yeah. Everyone. Oh, yeah. And then all the Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> you don't want to put them in the bed. In the what? In the pillowcase with the. Do we have one? I thought that was right there. It's full. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know. That one's already full. So tiny. Yoink. 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 Yoink.
Turtles and Tuatara, we don't have Tuatara here. They are a lizard that, um, they live on an island out in like Galapagos area and they have a third eye. So we think that they're like some kind of ancestral lizard. They're one of the oldest ancestral lizards that's still alive. Um, then we have turtles, which are closely related more so to snakes and lizards than they are frogs and amphibians. Frogs and amphibians are in a whole different clade um, with the cystalians and salamanders. So amphibians more together and reptiles are more together. They're related, but their last common ancestor was Tictalic, which is a tetrapod, the first tetrapod that came out of the primordial soup. Okay. Um, this is my little slide about population dynamics. So when you have a lot of snakes in an area, there's probably a lot of prey. And so this is a predator prey uh, graphing curve. The size of the population is on this uh, x-axis and on y-axis is time. Um, so as time goes on, you would see um, your rat population jump and then hit carrying capacity because they run out of food, shelter, water, and they oscillate right around carrying capacity. If you add a predator in, it drops them below carrying capacity so that they never get to this big population boom. So it, the predator knocks them down and keeps them um, at a lower population level, which is healthier, okay? We want snakes around they are disease control vectors, right? If you've heard of Honta, there's been a couple of Honta viruses in the state of Texas in the last few years, and that's carried by rats and mice. Um, and if you have snakes on your property, you will not normally have mice and rats. So they are checks and balances, right? Um, I wanna talk about a little bit the, the rattlesnake roundups. So, out in Sweetwater, Texas, they do rattlesnake roundups where they pour gasoline down uh, the den, the holes of the den, and the rattlesnakes will come up and out to try to get fresh air, and they pick them up and they put them in their bags, and they, they, they probably cull or kill um, probably about 50,000 a year. So that's an enormous take from the environment. And what happens, you take all the predators out, what happens to the prey population, right? And then what happens with snakes and other reptiles to most extent, they will up their clutch size by how much they eat. So if I'm a mama rattlesnake and I um, am the only one left after that roundup, right? There are rats as far as the eye can see. I can maybe have 12 or 15 babies instead of the six to five, the six out of 10 that I normally have. So when you take that amount of predators out of the population, the prey skyrockets. It's called an oscillatory um, exponential curve because the snakes will continually get higher in population even though they continue to take them down because of the clutch size Every time they're like, oh, there's food everywhere, let's up our clutch size, make babies everywhere, and that continues the rattlesnake roundup population. So really, if Sweetwater would just stop and let the rattlesnakes be, it would actually even out and the rattlesnake population would drop naturally. Um, but instead, they like to cull them and do their whole thing and whatever. Um, we talked about snakes are important. They, they have top-down predator regulation. So they're at the top of the food chain and they're regulating everybody underneath them. They're very important. Um, the, we talked about rats and disease vectors. The snake has a uh, rat in its coil and a rat in its mouth and he's just shoveling it in. <laughs> um, our venom, so everybody's like, oh, good snake, bad snake. Well, all snakes are good snakes. Uh, venom from copperheads, which we saw, uh, helps cure breast cancer, treats breast cancer. So the breast cancer drug that they use is derived from copperhead venom. Um, there's work being done on Alzheimer's right now with sea snake venom, which is really, really uh, potent for your nervous system. And then the uh, rattlesnakes that we have here, they, we, if you have high blood pressure and you're on high blood pressure medicine, you have a rattlesnake to thank. 
because they are the ones that gave us the tiny protein to put into the medicine to make our blood pressure medicine. So they're really important, um, not just the non-venomous guys. We'll talk about amphibians really quick. We have salamanders here, we have newts, we have, um, we don't have Sicilians. Those are a South American thing. They're like a worm that's an amphibian. It was really weird. Um, <laughs> we just don't have those. So that's a Sicilian. Um, we do have sirens um, and we do have like mud dogs. So the sirens um, are, they are amphibians, but they're legless. And so if you catch turtles a lot, you'll find them in your turtle traps. Um, and they just kind of hang out. They, they do nothing. They look like a snake, but they're an amphibian. Newts, um, life cycle of amphibians is tied to water. So they have to be around water to lay eggs. They don't have the hard shell that chickens or amniotes or sorry, uh, mammals and birds do. So they have to have the water to keep the eggs hydrated. Okay, what's the difference between top frogs and toads? Um, that's a co common question I get all the time. So toads have bumpy skin and they have parotoid glands. Um, frogs have very smooth skin and they're typically not poisonous. If you go to South America, all the rules are out of the window. <laughs> yes, um, so frogs, smooth, wet skin, really long jumps. So like the, the bullfrogs that you see that go like Whoop! frogs. Right? Toads are more of like a hop, 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 small hops, okay? Um, and they both do breathe out of their skin. So they, again, are tied to water. Um, but the toads that we have here, they have paratoid glands on them. And you can tell the different species of toad based off of the paratoid glands. I have a toad here that we can, we can play with and look at his paratoid glands. Those are the poison glands that are on top of its head. So if you ever had a dog that ate a toad and threw up and got sick and foamed at the mouth, it's because of those paratoid glands. Um, we do have crocodilians, as we saw outside. Um, we have alligators here in Texas. We used to have crocodilians, uh, like uh, American crocodiles in Florida, but they were hunted almost to extinction. So there's only a couple left and they're probably migrants from Cuba, from the Cuban crocodiles coming over to Florida. Um, so we really don't have a great population of crocodilians anymore. Um, I mentioned earlier, I did my master's on alligators and their parasites and uh, diet. I did my master's in um, Louisiana and Grand Chenier where they have the largest uh, population of alligators in Louisiana because in the 1980s, well, a lot even further than that. It's probably about 1980s is when they finally came back to a, a population that was a, a good hunting population. Probably in the late 1800s, they were almost hunted to extinction. And Rockefeller National Wildlife Refuge is where the last stronghold of it was. So in Rockefeller National Wildlife Refuge, they cull 22,000 alligators every year. That's for food, skin, research, anything you can think of. Um, and they have probably the most robust and healthy population of alligators because it's managed. Um, proper management does help with robust populations like our deer population. We have take limits, right? If you go across the border to Mexico, um, they don't have take limits and there are not any deer there. You come across the border into Brownsville, deer everywhere. And so these, these regulations are very, very important to keep people kind of in line and um, on the hunting ethical side, right? Um, there are largest reptile in North America. They have temperature dependent sex determination. So that's like turtles. Um, that, that means, sorry, that means that when they lay their eggs in the ground, um, the temperature of the nest determines if it's going to be a boy or a girl. Yes. So this 
climate change presents a, a huge problem for sea turtles. So if you think about uh, sea turtles, they lay their eggs on, on the beaches, and if it gets really warm, it's females. If it gets too cold, it's males. And then somewhere in the middle is a, a mix. Now, if our, our Earth keeps getting hotter, we'll have all female turtles, right? And after one or two generations of the males dying out, because we have no more males, we'll lose our sea turtles. So it's, it's interesting to think about the sex determination with the temperature because it affects so much more than just the population or it's actually affecting the demographic of the population, right? Um, they are carnivores and they are cannibals. So a lot of the time when we would open up the stomachs of the alligators for my work, um, we would find tags of the other alligators in their stomach, the little metal tags that they put in the foot. And like the big alligators, they'd have four or five of them. So you're like, oh, okay. It's a little bit weird. Um, so that's that's about alligators. Does anybody have any questions on alligators? Yeah. Yes. The temperature, what is the temperature range? One ten. Like it's gonna be in the in the sixties to seventies and eighties. It's a it's a range, yeah. Um, but sea turtles have a very narrow range. It's like a couple degrees. Yeah, so it's like two degrees hot is female, two degrees low is male, but the alligators have a much, much larger range. And that's, I mean, depending on the depth that they get buried, right. so the bottom ones are going to be one second the top ones. Correct, yeah. correct. And so that's how the sea turtles could correct for climate change. They could dig their nest deeper, they could go up further on the bank, on the, on the beach, and dig their nest deeper to keep them cooler. Um, but that's kind of up to the turtles, and we're kind of asking them to change what they've been doing for millions and millions of years because of climate change. Um, any other questions in our years? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to let everyone know that if you're having trouble seeing the screen, you can go online and join us in Zoom, and you'll be able to see the screen on your uh, phone. And um, I just <coughs> showed us a picture of Abby. It is. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's me um, doing my field work, and I'm on top of our, our biggest guy that we caught. He was 13 and a half feet long, um, and he was, he was enormous. Uh, we had to build a, a seesaw for him, to because when, so whenever we look at alligator stomachs, we pump them full of water. And we put, we essentially bought water worth it. So we put, we put a hose down their uh, esophagus, fill their tummy up with water, Heimlich it, mix all the stomach contents up, and tilt them back, and it goes up and out into a bucket, and I need my undergrads to pull through that. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> the big guy, we actually had to put bricks on the table, a big piece of plywood, and, and hang them down this way, and then hang him down this way and tilt him to actually make the stomach contents come up. Um, turtle. So we have our box turtle, we have our snapping turtle, and we have our red-eared sliders. We do have sea turtles in Texas. You have to go down to the coast, but they're there. You can volunteer at the sea turtle rescue place. Um, they are all sorts. So carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, our tortoises, we have a Texas tortoise, they're endangered. So if you see one, you should, you should call a game warden. Um, but the Texas, this is our Texas tortoise, um, they are strictly herbivores. They, they're strictly herbivores. And then the omnivores are our box turtles, like this guy. They love worms, they love strawberries, they like fruits and blackberries and insects if they can catch them. Um, and then this guy's uh, this guy's an alligator snapping turtle. You can see his his lure on his tongue. That he sits there with his mouth open and wiggles his tongue like a worm. And when a fish comes, he goes. <laughs> so that's how they're hunting. You uh, my probably my biggest fear of getting in. And it's funny we talked about that. My biggest fear of getting in like a pond or a river is me putting my foot right there. That's what scares me. Not, not much else, but that guy. 
Um, this is a temperature dependent sex determination, a little bit more on it. Um, the temperature on these guys is really low, but it, it's in log, so never mind. Um, baby turtle, that's a leatherback turtle. That's our largest turtle. We don't really get them in Texas, um, but they are enormous. They can be a couple tons heavy. Um, we talked about the threats to turtles. Climate change is probably the biggest threat. We also have pollution in the ocean. So sea turtles, they really love to eat jellyfish. And you know what looks like a jellyfish? Plastic bags. And so they will eat the plastic bags thinking they're jellyfish and they die. And they wash up on shore and they're like, what the heck? Um, the, other, the other threat is poaching. So people like the tortoise shell glasses, the tortoise shell decorations, cones and whatever, but, but poaching is a, it's a big problem for turtles, um, for food in some uh, in some Asian countries. I know they have turtle soup. Um, I've heard it's good, but <laughs> I've never tried it. Uh, poaching is, is a large threat for turtles. Um, you've probably seen these these guys everywhere. They're green and old. Calandra calls them garden dragons. <laughs> um, and we have quite a few species of lizards here. In Texas, we have fence lizards, we have scoloporus. Um, that's a fence lizard, that's a skink, that's a broad-headed skink. This is, oh, we have lots of skinks because we have lots of leaf litter. So when you leave the leaves, you're letting little skinks and stuff in and then that's also gonna help your snake population as well. Um, invasive species alert. So I talked to Leo about uh, the Cuban holes. They're everywhere. They come in on nursery plants in the trade in the nursery trade. Um, and they are out competing our native anoles, our green anoles. Um, and so those are one of the only herps that I will kill if I see it, mm. sadly. Um, What's a good way to catch them? Sorry. To catch them, or you can uh, this is terrible. You can take a big rubber band and mm. and shoot them with a rubber band and that'll knock them out. <laughs> they they look like they're like they look like a knolls, but they're brown and they're mottled, and and they look very different. So our our green anole is is very I think he's striking, um, but he's pretty easy to recognize. They do change color, um, so when it's cold they'll be brown or a darker gray, and then whenever it's it's mating season or they're warm, that's his mating dewlap. It's called a dewlap. Um, and he, he'll do push-ups and do his little do flap and try to impress ladies. <laughs> so the, the green so, and don't have those defining stripes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, they're just green and little white on the bottom. We have those in the shirt. And do you recommend killing them? Do what? When you see them, do you recommend that we kill them? Unfortunately, I do. Okay. Yes, I, I hate killing anything, um, but the invasive species, they've got to go. Um, a Cuban brown and all. Cuban brown. They're, they're a little bit bigger than the green and all. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, and then this guy is a Mediterranean gecko. You'll see them sometimes they get in your house. Sometimes they're on the brick walls and around lights and stuff. Um, but they are also an invasive species from the Mediterranean. Um, they are not as bad. They're kind of filling a niche that's not being filled right now. So they're not as bad, but I still have a vendetta against invasive species. Um, so these, these guys don't, uh, they don't get to live on my property. Um, we talked about the Jacobson's organ, why snakes split their tongues, lizards split their tongues too, right? They're um, two pronged and there's the Jacobson's organ connected to the brain. And that's why snakes smell you, or how snakes smell you. We have a couple of different families of venomous snakes in East Texas. We have the Alapidae, which is the cobra family. There's one representative in Texas. Does anybody know what that is? The coral snake. That's a coral. So they're in the same family as the cobras. Similar venom, uh, similar venom toxicity, but their mouths are very, very small. So the bites rarely, rarely happen. Um, our other uh, venomous species, venomous family is Viperidae. That's everybody else. The rattlesnakes, the cottonmouths and copperheads, they're vipers. 
And then we have the colubrids, which are literally everything else. Any non-venomous snake is a colubrid. Um, has anybody ever seen a timber rattlesnake? If you did, you'd be lucky as heck. Yeah, they are um, threatened in Texas, they're endangered. They live in the piney woods and um, they're probably the most docile rattlesnake we have in Texas and they're gorgeous. Um, so if you find one, call me. <laughs> so um, we know the coral snakes are venomous. We know the saying, red and black, don't jump back. Black, uh, red it touches yellow, kill the fellow. Yes. Um, so we see how they are mimicking. Uh, the king snake will mimic the coral snake and try and trick you, but the yellow is not touching the red, it's touching the black. Okay. Um, this, this rule works for North America. You go south, you're on your own. Um, they, that rule doesn't hold at all. Um, they are ground dwelling, so they're fossorial. They like to live underground, so you'll see them after big rains trying to get out of the muck. Um, but they'll eat the little snakes and the little lizards, um, insects, and maybe some like larva in the ground. Their mouths are very, very small. So for them to envenomate you, they've got to chew on you. Um, the, the bites are so rare now, um, they don't make antivenom anymore for them. They're that rare. But you're probably going to lose a finger or something. Um, so venom and fangs, we have fixed fangs like the coral snake. His fangs are just there all the time. We have uh, folding fangs like rattlesnakes, the, all the vipers, right? So they fold back. Um, this is a fixed fang. That's a coral snake. And then we have our vipers. So the copperhead, the co uh, cotton mouse, and our rattlesnakes. That, that is the species of rattlesnake we would see here, by the way. We won't see the western diamondback. They're too far west. And we won't see the eastern diamondback. They're more in Louisiana. So this, this is our one rattlesnake species. Um, that is the viper mouth closed. You can see his fangs folded up. When he bites and he flings forward, he flips his fangs forward. And so that's usually the first point of contact with vipers. They do have these heat sensing pits. That's with all vipers. And that's how they see. Um, they see in this infrared temperature. Um, so that's why at night they hunt. That's why I don't want to put my hand on the bag because they can see it, right? Um, so timber rattlesnakes, or they're also called canebrake rattlesnakes. They're extremely long lived. So imagine a predator that's 30 years old. And that's old for a snake. That's old, old for a snake. Um, but that's how long they, they will live. And they are an apex predator. Not many things will mess with them. Uh, wild pigs will eat their babies, which is a problem for the population. Um, they depredate, or that's, that's the right word. It's not predate, it's like a predate. Depredate. They depredate small animals, um, such as mice and rats. Um, they're really more mammal eaters. Their venom is, is geared towards mammals, and that's why it's so toxic to us, right? Um, one more thing about these guys, maybe. Uh, they do give live birth, so there's no eggs involved. Um, rattlesnakes, they will have the babies in their, uh, in their uterus, they hatch from these very soft eggs in the uterus, and they come out in the amniotic fluid. So there's there's no eggs or anything, and the mom will stay around for maybe a couple of days and hang out, and then she's she's like, good luck, guys. Um, that that is called ovoviviparous, um, a live egg birth. How many babies do they usually have? They can have up to thirty. Is that because of the uh, pressure on them from like pulling and stuff, or is it just like typical? It's it's typical to have a clutch size of like 15, but like a really big clutch size would be 30. Yeah. So snake girl fish are in the bunny, and bottom line must be just devastating. 
you have plus sizes like that now, yeah, they should be stable. So. They should. But it's normally so when people see a rattlesnake, their first indication is to kill it right. um, because they're they're very scared. They're, 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 yeah. Um, and, and I understand where it comes from, but whenever you have set an apex predator that's that long lived, um, you're doing such a disservice to the ecosystem when you kill that, right? It's like taking a mountain lion or taking a wolf out of the ecosystem. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, People just don't know. They don't. They don't. Um, They've got this beautiful orange stripe down their back that no other rattlesnake has. So that's one of their indicators. Mm -hmm. They do have a rattle. Um, this is them milking it. We talked about milking and you can see the, the fingers, this is a small rattlesnake, but you can see the fingers right there kind of massaging the venom glands on the side to pump the venom into the cup. Um, does anybody know how they make antivenom? So they take venom from a rattlesnake, let's say, or a copperhead or a cottonmouth, and they inject small, small portions into a horse. And the horse, over time, built antibodies to the venom because it's so big and they're giving it like a microdose, right? And then after a while, they'll take some blood from the horse, they spin it down in the centrifuge, and they take the antibodies out of the horse's blood, and that is antivenom. Wow. Yes. <laughs> And that's why it's so expensive. Do you know how much one vial of antivenom is? $14,000. People ask me, do you carry it with you? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just die. It's fine. <laughs> no one says medical bills. Um, so the cotton mouth, there is a reason they're called cotton mouth, right? They do this gaping thing whenever they're angry and they're like, look at my big white mouth, go away. Um, they have this really beautiful eye stripe, and that's what made me know yours was a cotton mouth because of the eye stripe on it. Um, they have this face that looks mean, and, and I love snakes, but they look mean. Um, they always kind of look angry, right, because of this scale that's kind of like plopped on top of their eye. This is the cotton lure that both cotton mouths and copperheads have. It looks like a little worm for a lizard to come up and whack it. Gonna get it for dinner, right? Mm -hmm. um, cotton mouse and copperheads are in the same uh, genus. So copperheads, that are little Hershey Kiss guys, they're a Kistrodon. Uh, they're a Kistrodon. This guy is a Kistrodon piscivorus, the is a Kistrodon contortrix. So same genus different species. They can't interbreed, but they're close. They're really close. Um, Semi-aquatic lifestyle, this is what I was talking about. You see them floating. Um, a ven venomous snakes float. If you see a rattlesnake swimming, they float. Um, they are typically aggressive, but they don't chase you. They actually have a set, determined escape plan, and sometimes that happens to be right through your legs. <laughs> so people will say, oh, they chase you, but really they're they're just trying to get away and they know where their home is, right? Um so they try and chase you out of their territory? No. So I've had some like they'll they they'll kind of like come at you or they'll like get in a boat with you yeah. because they're trying to like get out of the way. Oh, okay. You're just like stay still, you away. You know when I whenever the, the snake got on my boot, don't panic. Don't panic. And just, you can back up, step out of the way, or like get up on the bank because it's just gonna go down the river. So you're not, you're not trying to like fight the no. too much? No, no. Just calmly walk away. Advice paddleboarding or kayaking when that happens? If you get a snake hook. Because I just paddle really fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you should get a snake hook, like a tong. Okay. If you're, if you're having that much issues with them, getting on your boards. Um, they can grow up to five feet long, but that's a really big venomous snake, but rattlesnakes get bigger. Um, they're very variable in coloration. So they can have, like Leo had a, has a video of one that looks like a copperhead. It has a Hershey's Kisses, but it's very, very dark. Um, and then you can have really bright banding patterns like this, or just jet black. And so it's, it's kind of hard 
to sit there and go, oh, it's a, it's a cotton mouth when it could be a water snake. They look so similar, right? Um, they are semi-aquatic. They are fish eaters. Um, that's what Piscivorus means. This is the copperhead of Histrodon contortrix. They have a very mild venom, um, and they are masters of camouflage. Um, we talked about the Hershey Kisses pattern. We talked about the cobble lure on the young guys with the little, you know, little tail. Um, most mild venom of any, any venomous snake in Texas, and in recorded history, there have been less than 100 deaths from a copperhead. Recorded history, so like since like a miracle sound type thing. Um, and typically, it's an allergic reaction that kills you. Um, so anybody who gets bit, if you tend to have allergic reactions to things, you might want to throw your study pen. Um, but that the allergic reaction is what's going to kill you, not the venom. They sit. They sit coiled up. Where'd he go? No. <laughs> that guy. So he caught a lure in the tail. And he, he coils up and he sticks his tail up and he's just kind of like wiggling it like this until a lizard comes along. You see how bright green it is. That's usually the first indication of like, oh, that's a venomous snake because they're, it's a baby, and they're like, I don't know what that is, but it's got a bright green tail. It's either a cotton mouth or a copperhead. Mm -hmm. So how old is it? The cotton, the copperhead that we had outside the bigger guy, he still has just a tiny bit of yellow, just a tiny mm -hmm. bit. So the, they can keep it throughout their lives, but it's not going to be that bright. It's going to fade with, with age. I've seen one, was on TikTok, of course, but it was a... Uh... It's a rattlesnake, and it's a little lure looks like a, a spider. And it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just, that's a man. that's a Middle Eastern species of snake. It was cool. They're like, they're neat. Um, we talked about that. Masters of camouflage. I know you guys can't see the snake, but maybe on the phone, can you see him? Yeah. He's right smack dab in the middle of the picture. Look oh, right here. Wow, yeah. Masters that of camouflage. Just, wow. Anybody have any questions so far? I've been working in the flower bed and then like the same area all day. And then I look and I'm like, oh, there's the copper head there. The right there. Area. He's just relying on his camouflage. He's yeah. like, he doesn't see me. So I'm just going to like sit here and go under the radar. Pretend like, yeah. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so then we have our colubrids, everybody else who's non-venomous. I do have a hog nose up here that is venomous, but it's not venomous to us, just frogs. Um, now I have an ID quiz. Yeah, let's start with venomous or non-venomous. Venomous. This is a water monkey. So he's very, very black. He has, you can see his triangular head with the with the big fat uh, venom glands on it. And then if you look very closely, you can see a white eye line underneath his black striped eye. So that's a water moccasin. Who's this guy? The copperhead, right? Is he a young copperhead or an old copperhead? Yeah. 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 Sorry. Who's that? The rat snake, right? It's this guy. You can still see kind of the red tinge throughout. Venomous or non venomous? Yeah. That's a rattlesnake. That's a rattlesnake that's very unhappy because somebody has been messing with him. He's actually scared, so he's trying to put his head under his coils. And so that's what happens when you, when you really harass a snake, they do get scared and they'll hide. And so that's what he's trying to do. Some like a bird could peck at him or something like that. And they hide like that. What about this little friend? We're going to see him around. 
It's brown decay snake. Yep, it's a decay snake. They're eating baby little guys and they eat earthworms. So you'll find them in your garden, just kind of in the leaf litter doing their thing. Non-venomous good guys. Who's this? Yeah, it's a cotton mouth. It's a cotton mouth. He does have the Hershey kisses, right? They, they, remember I said they're very, very closely related. They're the same genus, right? Just different species. So they look similar. Yes, and it, this is a good picture of his venom glands too, that you can kind of see that they're, they're, his head is full, right? This guy's trying to trick you. So would you grab him? Yeah. Yeah, I would. <laughs> this, this is a water snake, um, but he's flattening his head out to try to trick you and say, I'm a cottonmouth or I'm a venomous snake and you don't want to mess with me. Um, but you can see his eyes, the, the Muppet eyes again, and then um, he doesn't have the, the dark eye stripe all the way through his eye like the cottonmouths do. He's, he's gaping, right? He wants you to go away because somebody just went like this and was about to go up step and he's like, don't do it. <laughs> what about that guy? No. It's a yellow belly water snake. That's actually a diamond back, but it's a water snake. It's a water snake. We have four or five different species of water snake here. Um, but yeah, look how flat his head is. And he's like, oh, I'm venomous. Don't, I'm tricking you. But he, again, he's got these big Muppet eyes and no dark stripe through his eye. Is it common for them to get a green hue to their head, kind of? These guys? Yeah, I've seen at work, they'll be like that mouse scale kind of has like greenish hue to them. It could be algae. Yeah. It could be algae, but then broadbanded water snakes, they're really pretty in like different colors. But I would I would probably guess it's algae. Has anybody ever seen one of these? Does, is it venomous or non-venomous? No. Yes. Non-venomous, right? We know the four that are venomous. So this is called a buttermilk racer. I caught this guy on my property. He's swimming in, in the pond. Um, and I think they're probably some of the most beautiful snakes that we have here. Um, they're just so speckled and just beautiful and they're not bitey. They're just the coolest to hang out with. What about that guy? Venomous or non-venomous? He's, non he's not venomous. He's trying to make you think he is. His head's too small. What else do you see? Anything about his scales, the coloration inside the scales? Because you can kind of see the red. So he's a rat snake. Yeah. That was it. You guys did great. Good job. Good job. So um, I have some of my cards for our habitat restoration business, if you guys want those. Um, this is snake skin, if you want to play with this. It is just like our fingernail, but it came from a rat snake, so it's too big. Um, this is a cottonmouth skull, and you can see his fangs. He's got double fangs on both sides because he's pushing one out to replace it on both sides, like sharks do. So you can see that on, on that. I have an alligator skull, alligator teeth. This is an alligator osteoderm. This is what makes them so hard and dinosaur-like. This is underneath their skin. So every plate that they have on their skin is an osteoderm. And then I have a little rattle. And a null. <laughs> the rat snake, which is very friendly, and your president named him Bob and gave him to me. <laughs> So there are three different frogs in here. There is a uh, hylocinaria, the green tree frog, um, the coach tree frog, and then a cricket frog down here being weird. <laughs> and they are super fun. You're allowed to hold them if you don't have bugs spray on your hands. Um, there are skinks in this a little brown skink. I believe this is a bullfrog. Yep, that's a bullfrog. 
Oh, this is a Gulf Coast toad. We can actually, if you guys want to see his paratoid glands, you can come look at them. Um, Gulf Coast toads are very, very common. They're the Encilius nebulifer. Um, you're thinking of the Houston toad. Yeah. The Houston toad is, is extremely rare and very, very threatened and danger. Um, and so they, they don't, you don't see them often. The people who are looking for the Houston toads go out at night and play recordings and try to listen for them. That's how hard they are to find. Um, so they, they are around, but their population is very low. Yeah. The whole wart thing is a myth. The whole wart thing is a myth. I've never gotten a wart, and I've been peed on all the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just walk around for you guys and show you this. So that crane, that is a cranial ridge on top of his head. That is the um, the dead giveaway. That is a Gulf Coast toad because of the cranial ridge. And then that little bump there, right there, and right there, that's his poison glands, the paratoid glands. Cranial ridge. Yes. I always find those. Yeah, they're really common. So cranial ridge. Cranial ridge and paratoid gland right here on each side. My course at Agrilife, we never usually have a meeting. Mike is, what do you do at Agrilife, Mike? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I juggle everything. I'll teach you lots about graphs. Turf, turf, turf. Thank you, thank turf. you. Thank you, turf grass, yes. There you go. Um, I'm the county extension horticulture agent for Montgomery County. Um, yeah, I'll do it, don't worry. Um, okay. I've, I've been in this area for about 11 years now. The, uh, I originally started down in Oasis County, down in the Corpus Christi area. Uh, as a result demonstration assistant. So I've actually worked in the row crops. And then when I became the horticulture agent in Montgomery County, I actually was in charge of the Texas Master of Naturals program and the, Texas, the Master of Gardener program in Texas County. Um, but when I moved up here, uh, it kind of splits off. The ag agent kind of takes part of that responsibility with the Texas Master of Naturals. And then I have 400 volunteers of Master Gardeners. So in a big demonstration facility and two of them sitting right here. So everywhere I go, I run into them. In fact, I was off the last few days and I ran into Lynn Shaw at Best Buy. And, <laughs> and my kids and my wife always go, oh, like, no, it's just the way it is. Um, so, you know, it's funny, we had some trainings and stuff this last week and I've been in the process of moving, let's see, um, moved out of my house, sold my house, moved in with my mother-in-law for a year and a half because we're building a house on property in San Jacinto County. In the meantime, she decided she was going to move to Seguin, so we moved her in three different loads, three different trips, moved my son, moved my daughter, and then, yeah, it's been fun, and we're, our house is going to be done Monday, so we're going to actually move in Monday, so we're just like, oh, thank God. Um, so I took the last two days off to do some tours and stuff, and I, I, we just happened to have a training last week, and I said, I didn't like the last presentation I did with entomology, it just didn't go well. So I talked to my mentor and I was like, hey, do you have a good entomology, basic entomology? He goes, oh yeah, send it to you. So Skip Richter, he was my mentor when I first came into the Yeah, good old Skippy. Yeah, good old Skippy. And, uh, and he now is running the garden line. So uh, he, he has done a lot of research and stuff with uh, a lot of organic or natural type treatments and things like that over the years. So, you know, we always have a chance to talk. And we, of course, we sat next to each other this trip and he's like, it was you know, there's always a catch-22 with everything you do, okay? Everything always leads to something else. So you have to be careful, especially when doing insects and everything else. So today, we're just going to do basic entomology. This is kind of the, I mean, if you want an entomologist and you want to be bored to death, go right ahead. Uh, because an entomologist will come in and literally your eyes will roll back in the back of your mind because they go into such in-depth stuff. I'm not going to do that. Today. So we're going to just talk about basic stuff. We're going to talk about article closet first. Um, you know, the whole thing is whenever you're looking for insects, you're going to look for visible signs, symptoms, things that could be causing leaves to curl, things, you know, chew marks. One of the biggest things I talk about in the National Air Program is the uh, tropical side webworms. People always think, oh, I've got moths, so I have webworms. 
No. Do you see the damage? So with everything that you you're looking at, you know, do you have damage that that leads to something? So as you move along, especially as a horticulturalist, as I move along and I deal with plants, I start to learn the main insects that are involved with certain plants. Now, there are things that are outliers. You know, all of a sudden you have this insect that somebody sends you a picture of and it's on a plant. You're going, no, that sucker, he's, he's a migrant. He's coming through and he's going somewhere else. Where is he going? Uh, what I didn't tell you is that I also worked for USDA plant protection quarantine in Hawaii for about six years. So I, I had some fun on the big island of Hawaii. And one of the one of the things that they had over there was um, on their banana fields, they had banana bunchy top virus. Okay. And they also had another virus that was called the papaya spot virus. What they found out is that the same insect was traveling from papaya to banana and banana to papaya. So and so they found out, oh wow, you know, this is kind of neat, but it's not. It decimated a lot of the banana plantations. The, the good thing about, uh, there was KL banana plantation on the Big Island of Hawaii. The best thing about what they did is they came in with resistant varieties and through plant tissue culture, were able to get back, able to get back up and running without shutting down the whole farm. So they were, they were real quick in response because of plant tissue culture. So there's ways to avoid some of the insects that we're, we're dealing with. Um, you know, how do you look for insects? A lot of times we have, there's some insects that, you know, as I've gotten older, my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. I used to be able to go, oh yeah, that's a two-spotted spider mite. And now I got, I, mm -mm, I have a microscope, I have a handle lens that I always carry with me. You know, it, it, my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. So that's one way to do it. The other way, any kind of monitoring method that you use, and like I said, I got a little I always carry my little hand lens with me just in case. Um, but anytime you go in and you start looking for insects, you know, you look under side, you look at, you're looking at eggs, you're looking at food, you're looking at whatever else that they're leaving behind, the symptoms and the signs that they're leaving behind. Uh, another way to monitor is using sticky traps. Um, that is a very good way to monitor insects. We do that a lot in our greenhouses. So this is my idea. The biggest thing is observing the plant material, looking for the damage that they're doing. Uh, sometimes that is something, an insect that goes right up underneath the, the waxy coat of the leaf, they get right up underneath and they'll create tunnels. Anybody seen what a citrus leaf miner does? Yeah, okay. Citrus leaf miner gets right under the waxy coating and basically the little larva and it'll sit there and tunnel through and eat eat its way through the leaf, and then you'll have these little squiggly marks. Uh, on in very early stages of that development, and, and when they start to feed, you'll see actual like pads. In a dewy morning, you'll see their pads, and they'll just like little squigglies. You know, when you try to, everybody try to do a little maze, you know, on paper, and try to draw it, that's kind of what it looks like. So they get up underneath that and do that. So, and so knowing the insects that you're trying to deal with or, or trying to evaluate is real important. So most of the insect mouth, like mouth parts, you have chewing insects, your grasshoppers, okay? I, right now I have the big black, orange and yellow grasshoppers. They get about that big, acres, huh? and they are thousands of them right now because they've all made it, they've all got young ones out and they are eating the yopon. Hey, yeah, yopon. I was like, wow, why does this yopon look funny? And then as I began to kind of get closer, I started to see a whole bunch of small ones in there. And I was like, aha. And then I saw mama down on the ground. I was like, aha. So, you know, hey, have at it. Come on. I got 29 acres of yopon. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any of your beetles, uh, a lot of times, you know, through horticulture and through the master garden program, we get a lot of uh, things that come in where you know, something eating my, eating my leaf. What is it? Well, you know, number one, what's the plant? You know, uh, you know what's going on with it? There's something else. A lot of times it comes in as a, hey, my plant doesn't look right. Something's wrong with it. And it's very vague. Or you get this, there's this little black bug. <laughs> yeah, that's this. A little black bug could be anything. So... There's a lot of ways in which we look at it as, as far as, and, and I'm just like a non-trained, in fact, 
most of my classes that I needed for entomology, right before I took those classes, I moved back to Texas from Hawaii. So I, I never really got to take entomology, but uh, through my job, OJT, on job training, I do a lot of entomology. So I get to learn from the best as well. So then you have chewing parts, you have rasping parts, which are kind of like your thrips, and then you have sucking insects like aphids, uh, white flies, scale insects, true bugs like plant and stink bugs. Okay. Particularly piercing sucking. Uh, let's go to turf grass. Can you give me an example of an insect that is piercing sucking that affects turf grass? Beetles. Beetles are going to be your chewing. Okay. I know what you're thinking about. No, I know, but I know what it is. I know what it is. Chinch bugs. Chinch bugs. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've trained them well. <laughs> so, chinch bugs are, are one of those insects that, um, what they, and here's the thing getting to know the insect, knowing what they like. Typically affect your St. Augustine grasses, and even though they'll affect zoysias and everything in the Bermudas as well but more than likely going to be in your St. Augustine grasses because why? It's about 99% of what we plant <clears throat> in our lawns. When they come in and feed, they're piercing sucking. So they're going to pierce and suck. So they're going to pierce into the grass. But the thing is, they inject an enzyme when they do. And so when they inject that enzyme, it clogs up the system of the turf grass. So therefore, you get yellowing and death that quick. Okay. And it basically shuts off everything. You, so you lose your water movement, you lose your nutrient movement, and, and, and uh, then the grass starts to die really fast. So knowing these types of things, knowing the way they feed, knowing a little bit about them always helps. And that way too, you know, and it, and it just goes back to, okay, something's causing this. What is it? It's the, this is CSI for plants. Okay? That's what I call it. You know, because it's literally what we do. I mean, it's, it's CSI. So chewing insects, okay, your grasshoppers, you can see some of the damage and stuff. We've been getting a lot of beetle damage lately on a lot of our plants. They've come up, you know, people come up and say, oh, what's wrong with my leaf? Especially in vegetable gardens. Okay. A lot of people, how many of you vegetable gardens? Okay. Give me a good example of a good chewing insect. Caterpillar, right? Tomato hornworm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Girl, the, yeah, okay, they, they, they love that stuff. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> scrub worm. Scrub. That's what the raccoons are. Yes, right. <laughs> so that, that's an indicator, isn't it? So a lot of times people come up to me and they'll say, you know, oh man, I've got armadillos and I've got this and that, and they're all tearing up my yard. Well, there's a reason why they're tearing up my yard. Okay. They have food sources there that they're trying to get to. So how do you control the animal? <laughs> Don't tell them what my timer is. Oh, Gosh. No. Um, so get rid of their food source or limit their food source somehow, somewhere. Um, grub worms typically in the north, they tell you to use milky spore, right? It doesn't work there. So we have to use other products as well. Skeletonizing and defoliation type insects. Okay, we have a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, leaf miners. We also have ones that affect uh, oak trees as well. So and you can see right here, there's a whole bunch of um, plant material gone. You have these little beetles or, or even uh, Worms that'll come in and skeletonize, basically eat everything in between the veins. Fall web worms. Do we have any problem with those? Yes. Yeah. Not near as bad as what they used to be. You know, and, and that's true. They they tend to like certain trees, right? Huh? I think it's a hickory. Hickory. Mm -hmm. So any of the pecans, hickories. Um, there in Corpus, we used to have huge infestations of them. Huge. I mean, you go around town, all they're just, I mean, they were everything was covered. And all of a sudden, it's, like it's, not, it's not like that. Yeah, used to burn them out. Used to burn them out? So, good point. So, 
they have mechanisms to protect themselves. With fall webworms, they encase themselves and they protect themselves with the web. Okay, so that is their protection. How do you how do you try to treat them? Take a hose. Hose and, and break the webbing, right? Or something mechanical and break the webbing, let the birds have them. Uh, down in Corpus, we had um, not only we had fall webworms, but certain times of the year we get a lot of wasps. But we'd also get a lot of um, fall the army worms that would be, you know, going up and down the trunks of trees and stuff. Mm. One day I just happened to be sitting there and I was I had a big mesquite tree in my front yard, probably the straightest, the biggest mesquite tree. My sucker was about the yay big around, and it was just straight up, 30 feet tall. Which I probably should have sold it. it was a lot <laughs> I kept seeing this wasp fall down to the ground, and I was like, what was that? You know, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then a couple minutes, you know, I was looking for it, couldn't find it, then I'd seen fly up and out. Then I'd see it again. I'm like, okay, what is the deal? So I just kind of hung there, and I started waiting. Well, guess what? He's not, that worm is not protected. So that's what he was feeding on. He was going up and feeding on the worms, and the worms were too heavy, so he would drop to the ground and eat them on the ground. So, and the reason why I'm telling you some of these things is because this is integrated pest management, okay? And, and I go back even to the days when I was working in row crops. You know, farmers monitor everything. They monitor all their, I mean, they, they have to be very careful with their pesticides. They're not, they are highly regulated. Homeowners are not. We know that. In fact, most of the problems that we see through uh, laws, regs, and everything else are homeowner problems. They're not farmers and ranchers and things like that. Occasionally have some in there. I've, I've had a few where they call and, you know, I had a subdivision actually in Corpus call and said, you know, all of our plants are dying and it's the farmer. He was spraying this stuff on this date and da 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 da. So I go to the farmer because I'm the intermediary. Because what happens is when somebody calls a, calls a complaint, especially with a state agency, Texas Department of Agriculture, which is the regulating agency, there's a big issue. Because then they get the lawyers involved and they get the science, you know, all this other stuff involved. So I go in and I start talking to them. I say, okay, when did this start happening? I already knew in my head, but I was trying to be very CSI for plants. I'm going to get the facts, right? Uh, I already knew in my head that we had a ton of rainfall. So all the plants were just soaked. All the soils were just saturated beyond the heavy clay soil. It was just muck. So I go through and I call a farmer, hey, you know, find out who it is. Hey, hey what's going on, man? You got, you know, you spray logs? Yeah, when did you spray? Okay, on this date. Da, 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 da. I go through and backtrack it. The wind is in the opposite direction. It's going away from the subdivision, the day he sprays. So what could it be? Huh? Runoff. Could be runoff, right? But it's water, water. exactly, it's water root rot. Mm -hmm. Root rots, and especially down there, when you get, you only have 25 to 28 inches of rainfall a year, versus 48 to 50 up here, it's a big difference. A lot of those plants that are drought tolerant can withstand that 25 to 28 inches of rainfall. Um, but when they get saturated for long periods of time, you lose all the oxygen in the soil, and the plants suffer. So. You know, that was the thing. She was like, oh, you know, all the insects came over here. So, you know, his spray came over here. So she was trying to blame everything else rather than just mother nature. So anyway, least toxic first whenever you do things. Uh, tent caterpillars as well. These are the ones that are, you know, you'll find them out there, big old clumps of them running up and down the trees. Uh, there's another one that comes out this time of year, which is the, the Giant bark aphids. You ever seen those? Mm -hmm. Those are cool. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like in a mass. Yeah. And it's funny, the first time I ever saw them, because we don't have them outside. First time I saw them, I was over in the bog garden at the, at the extension yeah. office. Oh. And I turned the corner and I saw something move, and I was like, what is that? And it was this big old mass of these insects moving up and the tree. Yeah. And then they'll, they'll all of a sudden move and they'll go in a straight line and all of a sudden they'll clump together. So it's like, cool. <laughs> But they can, in, in knowing, you know, hey, I was like, these are cool, took pictures, went in, started figuring it out. Oh, giant bark aphids. Okay, these are cool. Do I need to kill them? Well, no. 
but they can reach populations which can damage trees eventually. So are they just migratory? We see them there day after day. Yeah, right. Then, then it's not going to be an issue. You know, I mean, it's going to be an issue at that point if they're there day after day. But if they're just there and gone, they're not causing a problem. Tent caterpillars. Um, I had a gentleman in the South Texas I was working with. He had 15 acres of land. Five acres around his house was all landscaped, and he had mesquite trees. He calls me up one day and says, hey, all my mesquite trees are turning yellow. And I was like, what? Mesquite trees turn yellow. Well, did you spray anything? You know, I went through the whole, did you spray anything? Did you put any weed and feed on your yard? Which is a no-no. No, no that you, y'all are all, oh, don't get him started on weed and feed. Um, so, you know, I'm asking all these questions. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I'll, I work fixing to head out of town. I'm going to stop by and everything. And I go out there and I start to do my investigation. Number one, I see a lot of black grass coming. I mean, just stuff. I'm like, okay. Then I start looking around. And the way the mesquite tree is, it's got a stem, and then the leaves come off that stem. They'd eaten all the leaves off and left the stems. So that's why he thought they were turning yellow. Okay? So I was like, ah, you had a case of army worm. What? So the passive way to do it is, number one, they they come in and they, they go. They're quick. They Overnight, they defoliated them. I mean, I'm talking... 25 foot circumference mesquite tree defoliated. So, number one, large population. Number two, there's not a single soul there. They're gone. Where did they go? And so, you know, how do you protect the rest of the trees? You know, well, they're feeding insects. We'll get into that a little bit later, but it, it's really kind of cool to do that. You know, hey, what's going on? And you see all the poop and the crotches of the tree and everything. It's all just sitting there because, I mean, they're feeding, they're eating. I used to make my kids go out when I had tomatoes in my backyard. And with the tomato hornworms, they, you know, I don't spray or anything. I don't put anything out there. I said, you know, you pick them off and you paint. And they went, what? You paint. You put them down on the ground and you squish them. Uh, and it, they nice and green paint, you know, because that's what they're eating. They're eating green leaves and you squish them. It's all green. So paint them. Uh, you got a lot of loopers and everything, so a lot of times we get into these these insects that are extremely small, and we don't really notice them. Leaf rollers are really good. Leaf rollers get up in there and they'll let, roll that leaf in to protect themselves, especially in bougainvilleas or even uh, Texas mountain laurels. They love a can of lilies. The can of lilies as well, exactly. Yeah. And and it's hard sometimes because we don't typically see them when they're at their smallest stages. We notice a little something's wrong, but then we have to find it, you know, once once they start getting up a little bigger, then we start to, oh, well, yeah, there it is right there. But we have to kind of train ourselves to kind of look at these insects in a different manner. So um, a lot of times, too, some of these insects not only do leaf rolling, but they'll also protect themselves with a little, uh, you know, a some netting or something like you know some webbing or something like that uh one of the ones is, is mites mites do the same thing uh bagworms those are cool i'm sorry they just are i had uh, in corpus had somebody bring one to me the bag was about that big on it it was huge and, I, and they put it on my desk and i was sitting there working and typing and everything else and all of a sudden i see the head pop out the top. Like, <laughs> Take a picture, yeah. Um, but what they do is they collect, you know, they basically have their uh, webbing and everything that they collect a lot of material that they're chewing on. They make themselves this little cocoon. And it is literally just like a hole with a little lip that closes open and closes on it. Uh, they're neat. They're really neat. But we have, you know, bagworms. I don't and the funny thing is, is that I don't see the infestations I used to see. We're, you know, we're constantly, I think, you know, changing and maybe there's more predators in the area, just depending. But Corpus, I've got a guy that I talk to constantly. He constantly sends me stuff. Hey, what's this? Hey, what's this? Hey, what's this? You know, back from when I was there, I was like, do you know that you have a new county agent down there? Call him. <laughs> 
so um, he said, yeah, but you know the place better than he does. I'm like, I don't, don't go there. Let's call him. Uh, but, but the bagworms, I mean, we'll have them all around the eaves of the house down there and stuff like that. And, um, one day I went out and I had some Mexican heather. And I was like, what the heck happened? I mean, it was like cutting, like somebody really chopped it. And I was like, wow. Okay, well, leave it alone. Let's see what goes on. Next thing I know, I'll start seeing the bagworms. So, well, that's what happened. They were carrying stuff up and getting that way. Uh, saw flies as well. I've uh, been seeing a lot of these lately. Um, we've got, uh, you know, when you have moist conditions and you have a lot of favorable conditions like this, what it does is just kind of, you kind of have an acceleration of, of growth. Not only plant material, you have young plant material, which makes it more susceptible, but you also have young insects that are constantly being hatched and, and coming out. So you'll get a lot of, and, and in some cases, you'll get three or four generations real quick. Um, that was, you know, like chinch bugs. Some years we get, you know, three, four, five, six generations. So, you know, how do you deal with those types of insects and what, what can you do to treat them? Like I said, leaf miners, uh, leaf miners are really hard to treat. You have to be very in tune with the insect. When they come out, most of the time what we see is the result of their feeding. So if I see the result of something, am I going to treat it? No. Yeah, it's too late. It's too late. And so that's, that's why, you know, identification of most all these insects and kind of learning a little bit about them is real important. You know what their lifestyle is, you know what their habits are, um, you know what kind of damage that they, they do, and that way you can treat them appropriately. They give you tiny... Uh, sometimes if you treat things ahead of time, now I'll admit, a lot of my homeowners are very impatient <laughs> and they want to call, they want something to happen now. They want to see dead bodies. <laughs> That's what they want to see. They don't, don't care if it's good or bad. They just want to see dead bodies. Um, you know, I, and I think, you know, as time has kind of passed, we have a lot of products now that are that are targeted towards certain insects. It's not as you know, like diazin on malathion. Those are very broad insecticides. We have a lot of insecticides now that are very targeted. Same thing with weed control products. They're they're they've kind of gotten rid of some of those real bad ones that are that are more toxic to some of the other things. So you know, how would you treat a leaf miner? Remove the leaf. Huh? If it's a really leaf, okay. For the larva, for passive the larva. way of doing it. So, BT. Okay. Will BT work on something like that? You know what BT is? Bacillus thuringiensis. Yeah. It's a soil-borne bacteria which, when ingested by a worm, it gives them heartburn they'll never forget. Okay. So, is that what? From the larva. Okay. They're surface feeding. They're feeding below the surface. It won't work. And then you gotta penetrate. Right, it has to penetrate. And with BT, it is a surface. I mean, it's gonna dry on the surface. So if they're underneath the waxy coating, then it won't work. There's an enzyme that works once they're already on the plant. So the enzyme gets absorbed by the leaf. Okay. And there are also systemic type products that are used. And that's what I try to do last year's work. Always, you know, and that's that's with extension. You know, our job is you know kind of save people money, time, and the environment, one way or the other, uh, our natural resources. So you know, a lot of people, when they get impatient and they want a systemic insecticide, which gets drawn up through the plant, translocated through the plant, and when an insect feeds, they get the problem. So that is a good, that is a a pretty true way to to eradicate them. However, they don't really reach populations so fat, so big and large that they cause a major deficit. To the plant. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to, you know, if we have the whole plant's drooping, curling, and has damage, then we may want to consider go ahead and, and treat it at that point, but only at that point. If you have just a few leaves and you can get them early, like I said, some of those dewy mornings, you can actually see the trails before you actually see the actual damage that occurs. And if you can remove them at that point, you got good control. 
Uh, leaf rollers, like we talked about earlier, these are uh, these are fun because they get up in there and you know how do you treat them? When do you treat them? Yeah, it's almost too late. I've had to do a mechanical every time I see them in my can. It's just yeah. out there with a really long tweezer. Tweezer. Yeah. So the uh, Bogavias, uh, Canas, Texas Mountain Worlds, they'll get up and roll themselves up. They're protected. One of the things that the uh, um, tropical sod webworm, the larva stage gets into the crevice of the grass and people will treat, but they don't control them when they treat because they're not treating at the proper time. The thing is, like that particular insect, they come out in the evening right before dusk and they come out and feed at that point in time. So a contact insecticide would only be good applied late in the afternoon, almost to the evening. That's when it's going to come in contact. Yes. They're just a bunch of cannas and then be friendly with Track them. crop. Yeah. There you go. Track crop. Okay. We, we do that at the extension office. There's some times where we plant the uh, cardoon. Yeah. The, some, uh, yeah. No, cardoon. Yes. We plant track crops to get them to go somewhere else. We don't want them on the tomatoes and everything else. So we plant a track crop. Now, is it 100%? No. Uh, flea beetles. This is this is the yeah. one. That's, this is the one we have a lot of big problem with, especially this year. Yeah. And, it, and it tends to be, you know, most of these insects are kind of waxing wing. Some years they're going to be worse than others. This year we've seen a lot of damage. Yeah. Damage. What's an insect that we would see out in the forest? What is a major insect that we see out in the forest area? Mosquito. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we see those in South Texas too. Um, my brother-in-law said we went on a wildlife refuge hunt several years in a row. He always got selected. He's like, you need to go with me. Well, I didn't realize that we had to trudge a mile in through swamp infested areas. Um, and um, we, what we found is we found a sunscreen that had off in it. Okay. And he said, how's the best stuff in the world? He puts it on him. I mean, I'm talking, we're in the swamp. Rockport, you know, Texas, you know, we're, we're kind of north of that, you know, the wildlife refuge. And we're walking down the trail in the morning real early, and I'm going, why am I doing this? Uh, and I look over, and my light hits his hat. I said, hey, Frank, I said, What's that? What, what color is your hat? He says, tan. I said, nope, it's black. Oh, he didn't rub that on his head. They, they were just covered, and I'm talking swamp skiers, the big ones. Oh, no. Yeah, that stuff saves. Woo. Yeah. Mosquitoes, one of them. What is a pest of the trees? Beetles, pine bark beetles, right? There's beetle, pine bark beetles, graver beetles. So we have a lot of a lot of insects out there that are that are detrimental to our natural environment. How are they monitored? What can we do about it? You know, it's something that happens. Mother Nature takes care of it most time. Yeah, late, the yellow orange and leaf beetles. Uh, we'll see a lot of those come through the gardens uh, at our office. The, uh, you know, the whole thing is, is whenever you have something that's feeding, you have to use those you know, integrated pest management strategies, strategies and say, you know, is this going to result in a loss? that I'm not going to deal with. I'm, I'm just not going to take a loss. And I'll give you an example. Fleas and ticks. How many have ever had a problem with fleas and ticks? Yeah. We used to dust our dogs with seven dust. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, my wife and I moved into a house in the corpus, and the neighbors said, oh, yeah, we've had a real big problem with fleas and ticks. And I'm sitting there going, okay. Interesting. I found a tick on my son, and he was a baby. I declared war. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I went to the product, the active ingredient carbol, which is seven, and uh, I jumped fences after dark and treated my neighbor's yard. I sprayed up and down the fences of both sides on everybody's yard. I think my neighbors behind me wondered how their dog was getting in their patio. You're <laughs> like, <laughs> several times. And every 
seven to ten days, I'd do another treatment for three treatments. Number one, you kill the adults. Number two, you break the cycle. So then they have several generations. You start breaking the cycle and you have a reduction in population. Okay. I didn't have another fleet of fish for five years that I lived in that house. Because I created a perimeter. But that was it. It was the best thing to do. Well, I was protecting my family. So there are insects that are damned that they can kind of like, you know, cotton mouths and, you know, uh, any kind of venomous snake as far as I'm concerned. In fact, the funny thing is when I walked in, I remember when I was in Kingsville, I actually took a venomology course. She was talking about how the uh, some of the venom actually treats cancer and things like that. And that was what we would do. We actually separate out all the proteins. We have a big machine that we would separate, separate out individual proteins within the venom. And it, and it was really neat because we were trying to find out all these cures and, you know, they're, they're doing things like that on a consistent basis. Um, but, it, but it's really interesting stuff. So if there is a hockey, you know, when we get the West Nile virus and things like this, what does that trigger? That triggers an alert, number one, but what are we going to do about it? Well, the next thing you know, you got crews going around the neighborhood spraying at night and everything else. You ever been outside when that happens? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they once over the woodlands, they spread like a neurotoxin with the plane. Uh, yes, they, in fact, that was during Harvey. They flew those C 130s. I mean, that's a government deal. And, it, and that's scary because they fly a treetop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that was one of the things, too. A lot of the bee producers and stuff in the area were freaking out we about were it. Covering our bees. Mm -hmm. Yep. We found out that's the right. schedule. Yeah, right. Wow. And you know and that's to protect life. Okay, there's at some point in time you have to kind of give in a sense. I understand they're bad products sometimes, but not like they used to be. Okay. Is that what caused the lightning bugs? When I was a kid, I remember I could go in my pasture, lightning bugs everywhere, and yeah. now I go home and I'm like, yeah, there's nowhere. Yeah, well, a lot of the products that they were spraying were targeted to just mosquitoes. Okay. That's just because we've caught them all in jars and just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a ton of lightning bugs out of my property. So I'm, I'm happy. Um, but yeah, that that's some of the things you kind of have to think about. You know, there, there's a point in time where we have to trigger uh, trigger things just because it's it has to do with life. Um, insects, you know, when you have cattle and things like that, certain things. Same thing with cotton, producing cotton. They have the cotton bowl weevil program in Texas, in South Texas, especially down there. Cotton, we wrote a cotton bowl weevil eradication program, you know, because it takes a pound of cotton to make, make a shirt. And if we, if we can't produce that, then there's a problem. Yes, ma'am. Back a couple of years ago now, the commissioner in the Woodlands area in his newsletter, they were spreading out with mm -hmm. oh, And I was, uh, I was like, oh my God, I thought that it was illegal. Yeah, malathion is still out there. Uh, diazinon they got rid of. Which I still have the bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always hold on to that. You know, I mean, but like studies could show that like organic methods outweigh the outcomes of like uh, chemicals and synthetic. Yes and no. I beg to differ. And the reason, so with organic type products, man, and I'm going to get on my high horse for just one second. When it comes to organic, Organic is a term that is used for small farmers to compete with large farms out of California. That's what they had to do to differentiate their product and say it's safer, it's better for you. It is no better for you than the stuff that came or came from them. In fact, the spinach scare that we had, you know, with, that came from an organic farm. And guess what? Wild hogs ran through it. Could it happen to a regular farm? Yes. Okay, it had to do with the cleaning process. People kind of use the things to move things their way. Now, do I agree with the pesticides and using the napalm first? No, I don't. Okay, that's not the way I roll. I let Mother Nature take care of it. But there are people that they go double barrel right off the bat. Okay, I get it. So when you talk about organic methods, there is very little real research that is done to show the benefits. Now, let's talk about tomatoes. 
I have people that say, you know, organically grown tomatoes are much better for you than the other commercial varieties. Nope. There's a product out there that there's called the one's called Geo Rose. It's a tomato. It has higher antioxidants than any tomato, any fruit, anything you ever had. They bred it that way. You know, we're talking about, you know, genetic modification. GMOs, right? How many GMOs are really there? No. The problem is we're using GMO incorrectly. We're all genetically modified. Like the breeding. Okay. So when now when we talk about gene insertion, that is completely different. So for instance, cotton. Cotton down in South Texas, they put a gene in there that's called Bolgard. It's injected into the plant cell. Okay. That gene is injected in there, so it'll resist the bold or control the bold. There's other products the same way. They do that with Roundup to have Roundup ready cotton, Roundup ready corn. They inject the, 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 the component in there to where it protects it from being sprayed over the top. Right, so you can be ready and stuff. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, now, I have a theory. I always tell people, would you rather drink malathion or eat some rotenone? Because when you look at lethal doses, the organics, much higher lethal doses than what some of the synthetics are. Um, nicotine. Guess what? Nicotine is really bad. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. So there are corn products and so forth that are injected to resist these. Right. So they bloom. But they are for bees. They don't know if there are birds. So there's an impact to those species. You know, yes. there's a lot of, yeah. There's the, science behind that there is a problem and part of the, the, the downward of yeah, the but population. It, it's the same thing, though. If you're targeting a pest, you have to remember, with like even an organic product, if you're targeting a pest, you're going to target everything. Right. So there is. So selective. There is some data that suggests that, but it also goes the other way as well. And, and I've looked at it over the years because I'm not one to go one way or the other. I, I look at the facts. My mind is science based. And when I was in Hawaii, we had one of the professors we were talking about, you know, all these synthetic fertilizer and all the synthetic, you know, insecticides and everything else. He said, why don't you just get you a pack of cigarettes, open them all up, soak them in a jar, and then spray it out. <clears throat> oh, neo, yeah, nicotine, neonicotinoids. You know, there's man-made ones and there's natural ones. That's some bad stuff. Some, some man killed his wife. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Mm-hmm. That's right. So my understanding is like, so I guess, and maybe it differs, the, the, the definition of organic varies from person to person, but like, well, no, organic is everything. Everything is organic. It's live. Yeah. yeah, it's live. The fact is, is we get pushed in a direction to make everything seem like it's bad for me. Why? Somebody else is benefiting from it. And, and that's the thing. Now, like I said, I'm not one to go one way or the other, but if I got a whole bunch of worms they're feeding, I'm going to go to BT because they're feeding. It's the process. Go to a natural product that's so born bacteria that's going to be ingested by a worm. Now, am I going to kill good worms? If they're feeding, okay? Some people all, you know, the bees. The bees are a big thing. Bees are not native to here. No. The, and that's, that's the well, thing is that we, we I mean, have to educate ourselves on these things. And let me tell you, we've got through extension, um, there have been some publications that have come out AM wide on GMOs. Okay. And I had a lady one time that came in from the north, and this, this is a good one. She, was, she lived up in the north, and she came in, and I could see that she was very uncomfortable. And I said, you know, man, can I help you? We didn't have any master guard in the phone room that day, so I came out. <laughs> so I had I was out there and I was helping her, and she just and I said, man, I said, you seem really uncomfortable. She goes, Well, y'all are in the pockets of big money. And I was like, 
What? <laughs> what? I said, maybe in your neck of the woods, but down here, we do things the other way. We get people that are pissed off at us because we won't to recommend their product because they didn't have any science basis, and we've done research on it, and it didn't show. Um, there was a company, I'm not going to name it, but they wanted us to test all these products, and we did, and we didn't find out what they wanted, so they don't they don't deal with us. They don't want to talk about it. It didn't do what they were – we didn't do what they were hoping we would do. That's not the way we work. We have research. It, it's stuff that we do at the office. You know, if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, then it's not good. Simple. So you have to be, you know, and not everybody's going to do it. And I don't expect y'all to all of a sudden change your ways or anything else. That's not what my point is. My point is, it's just every situation is different. You know, that, that having the flea and that tick on my son, I, mm -mm, no, I've got to protect my family. I don't want him to get Lyme disease or anything else. So I've got to do something drastic in order to protect. Now, when it comes to, you know, uh, stuff around the yard, well, is it on the label? Are you going to kill things unintentionally? Okay. Yeah, it happens. Bees? Yeah, could be. A lot of times I get the phone calls this time of year. We don't have any bees this year. Well, bees move. They don't necessarily, they may not have a food source that's there, or they may pick up and move. We have bees in the office right now. We got hives that are in decline. Yeah. We can't figure out why, right? It's, it has to do with the environment. There's so much more going on than just little things like that. Okay? Good? Okay. We always, yes? <clears throat> I'll, I'll say my bias out front. I'm a big keeper. But all of the problems we have are not just honeybees. Honeybees are not native, as you said. Right. But, and they're generalist, and they will kind of be anything. Yep. Our problem that we're facing, the big extinction, if you will, mm -hmm. is all the other native pollinators, of which we have about 4,000. Mm -hmm. But they're also in major decline mm -hmm. because of chemicals and habitat mm -hmm. and all those other things. Yeah. So, yes, I'm concerned about honeybees. Yeah. But really, <laughs> honeybee collectors, our big issue is all of the pollinators. Global. Yeah, it's global. And, and it's not just... <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny. I've seen hives that are laying on both sides. Honeybees. Um, you know, we've got the hives at the office, of course. But then uh, my 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 son, they they called him Bumblebee at one point in time because he was at school and the the janitor came through and threw down a, a, a pizza box and it hit a bumblebee and the bumblebee went quack. And this is like first week of school <laughs> when we first moved here. He got hit. Stung, you know, bitten by a bumblebee, his face swelled up and everything. It was like, poor kid, you know. Um, you know, you see bumblebees, and, and it just like right now, I see a few, I don't see a lot. I'm not seeing any. And to me, I guess looking at the whole picture, I'm looking at environmental, you know, just a little bit of change now. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I have 175 years of data for Noasis County, okay, weather data. And you can see there is such cyclical things, events that occur. 175 years of data. That is just a minuscule of data. It's weather. It's a weather pattern. <laughs> so did we affect it? Yeah. You know, there's things that we do that urbanization affect Urbanization has been a real. Huh? I think having urbanization. Oh, has yes. Been a real oh, yeah. You think about of, the impacts of what it has on our water systems and everything else? Yeah. Oh, here's a good one for you. Talking about, you know, urban development. In Corpus, there was a, this is always kind of an oxymoron, Zero State Corpus Christi, by the way, that were housed in the water department <laughs> in Corpus. What? Does that make Zero sense? State Corpus Christi, okay? They were housed in the water department. The water department wants you to buy right? water. And then Zero State's telling you save water. <laughs> that always cracked me up. Um, it was, it, that was funny. But so you have the you have water conservation that occurs. 
they would still, excuse me, not this, they would test water downstream in certain estuaries and things like that. Lake Mathis dumps out into the bays. There's certain streams, Oso and stuff like that. And they would go and they'd do these tests. And they would say, uh, found traces of this put out by farmers. And I'm like, no, you're wrong because the farmers put it out next month. Homeowners have already started putting out stuff. And, so, and oh, they didn't want to publish that. Mm. They want to blame the farmers. And yet the farmers are regulated. So it's you know they, things like that. You yeah, gotta really. I mean, regulation is pretty limited. I have a pesticide license, and I could tell you, like, if anybody wants to lie, they're gonna lie. And they can't. Yeah. Uh, this, but the the thing is, is that if you get caught, well, I mean, the chances are like. But are you following the rules? I mean, you should be. You should. Be. Yeah. Right. And and that there's regulatory agencies can only do so much. Texas Department of Agriculture is. The regulatory agency, they come by and they inspect their greenhouses once a year. It's the only time I see those guys. They come through and they walk through and it's out, done. Next thing you know, I got a piece of paper on my desk that says, okay, you're good. Well, am I really? You know? Right, exactly. You know, I've been audited by, that was funny. I said, what did you, what have you sprayed in the last five years? And like, blank piece of paper. And he goes, what? And this is when I was in court because I got audited by TDA. I said, I don't have any demonstrations. I just have the license. That's it. Because we didn't do any pesticide or anything. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, no, you had to spray something. I was like, nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, no. You know, but they do get ready. They, they, and the instant that they have a complaint against them, they dig deep. They, I mean, they have to have spray records. They have to account for all the products that they put out. Yeah, but they can claim that they didn't spray anything, even though they did say, and then if there's no record, they it could be can, but then they go to the next step. Then they go test. Yeah. And the laboratory test, ooh. Oh, yeah. yeah, they take soil samples and they'll find it. Trust me. Now we've had, we had um, one of those in Rosstown where uh, the farm next to it, to this lady, uh, they killed an oak tree on our property. And what it was is the wind just switched that day and it picked up real fast and kind of whirlwinded through and it hit the tree. And the farmer's like, look, it's my fault, you know, and it is what it is. I mean, I think the award was like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, and he owned it. Yeah, and that's the thing is that they're pretty much, you know, for the most part, a lot of them are very conscientious. About it's like that in Texas City. But <clears throat> when it rains, mm -hmm. uh, that's when they belch out all the chemicals. That's right. And see, I, we, we used to have a weather a weatherman down in Corpus that would say. All right, I was going to rain this week and go out, put your fertilizer out. <laughs> and, and I would always go, okay, here we go, red tie, algae blooms, here we come. And he stirred up, that's what would happen. And it was like, you know, everybody going out and doing this because the weather guy said, I finally got him to stop. Because I started doing the weather. Uh, oh, it's going to, I mean, I put my columns and stuff and I'd send stuff out and everything. I ran into him at the, um, at one of the home and garden expos and he said well uh you know you, you sure do think you know a lot about weather and i said you sure think you know a lot about fertilizing lungs and, taking care of <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he kind of sat there and i said and he, he goes okay point taken <laughs> I said, i'll stop weather <laughs> so you know it, it's just one of those things that we end up dealing with um leaf cutting bees a lot of times you see these on roses They'll make those kind of half moon or half circles in there. They'll get in there and they'll start chewing and another native pollinator in a sense. Okay. But they'll come in there, start chewing on plants. Um, one of the biggest things, you know, scatology, scat, you know, we're looking for evidence of insects. Uh, a lot of times, too, you're looking for, um, for reproductive parts, especially for some of the good bugs. If you ever see this little, you'll see it, the, the lace, green lace wings. It's like a light pole, okay? You have a real fine string, like a white string, and then you have at the top, there's a little white oval kind of ball at the top. Lots of green lace, you know? You'll see those. Sometimes you'll see a group of, uh, a group of them, a, a group of eggs that are real close together in a mass. And, and let me tell you, I didn't realize how many different types of stink bugs or how you could tell different types of stink bugs and, and beetles and things like that by the, 
I got into that one day and I was like, wow, there's 10 other different types that have something. So, oh, wow, that one's good. You know, looking at stuff like that. Um, so whenever we see, you know, symptoms from chewing insects, you know, you're going to have leaf, uh, some leaf issues, uh, some of the leaf missing. Uh, the one that always stands out for me is this lady brought in a cookie sheet full of her turf grass. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and it was a cookie sheet. And she had, you know, it's a little bit of soil and everything. And she said, I don't understand what's wrong with my grass. She goes, it looks like somebody has mowed harder. And lo and behold, the grass was about this tall on this side and looked like this on the other side. But what you, when you get a little closer, you can actually see the chew marks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could see that they kind of divided it in and chewed it like somebody went chomp. You know, and it's kind of neat. And I was like, oh, we knew exactly what was going on. But the other thing is, too, is that in the cycles, the life cycles of these insects, you know, I know when to start. I've got old news columns that I kind of just keep in the background. I know when things start to happen, and I go, oh, guess what? I'm going to throw that one out there again about fire ants. Right after a big rain, certain temperatures, boom, we're going to have a big fire ant problem. So we'll throw that out there. You know, those types of things. Right now, uh, wing dance and termites. That, so I think that's, so that's, that's do you ever perfect. suggest, like, getting rid of grass and saying grass is the problem versus trying to continue to tell people to dump chemicals on the ground? No. The, the grass is not the problem, it's the homeowner that's the problem. <laughs> oh, I see, yes, yeah, true, true that, true that. In fact, I was, I was over there walking around typing because I had three or four questions I wanted to lay, <laughs> knock out because I know I'm not going to be in the office for a couple of days, but one of them was like, what's this weed? It's this, there's publication. That's how you treat it. And then the other one was, what's wrong with my neighbor's yard? I don't want to meet it, I don't want to get it. Well, tell him to water his yard. You know, I mean, it, the problem is, is that we see a problem and we want to throw something on it immediately rather than investigating it further. I'm glad these people are contacting me because a lot of times they give me the what they think it is. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're not. But I always try to do my best job to educate. You know, what are some of the issues? You know, when did you see the symptoms? What, you know, there's, there's questions I lead into the CSI for, you know, where are we going with this? What type of, uh, you know, are, are, did you see symptoms in the fall? Did you see symptoms July, August, that all of a sudden the grass was dead and it got bigger every day? Did you see yellowing first before this happened? It, so there's a lot of things that distinguish between take all root rot, uh, chinch bug damage, uh, sod web worms, um, grubs, even. You know, you're watering your grass. Are, are you watering it too much or not enough? The, the biggest thing is people just water it too dang much. Like, here's, here's the deal. Turf grass. We get 50 inches of rainfall a year, right? Okay. We have 26 weeks of actual growing season for turf grass. 26 weeks. Turf grass needs one inch of water per week. You got more than that. That's what you're saying. Exactly. I water my lawn three times a year. That's it. Three times a year. And that's if... We go through that little dry spell like we normally do, late June, July, you know. We always go through like three, four weeks or something like that, or we don't have any moisture. That's the only time I want. And you know what? My lawn looks just as good as everybody else. In fact, it's a lot better because it's not being stressed out by too much water. It has good deep root systems. It's able to survive and last for that long period of time. It's not stressed out to where the chinch bugs come in and say, hoo hoo, field day because it's weak or take all root rot comes in because it's weak. So that's what you have to think about too. Things that are weak get attacked. Like how I roll things back into what we're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if a tree is suffering from lack of moisture, which, you know, we're still losing trees, you know, back from the droughts, yeah. you know, well, when a tree is weak, it doesn't have the ability to protect itself. Uh, just like us, we get tired dragged down, worn down, we catch a cold, we get a sinus infection, we get sick. Same thing with plants. Problem is it takes them longer to recover. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of things that we can see as far as, you know, chewing parts, as far as what damage is there. Uh, like I said, we have some of those insects that kind of get right underneath the uh, waxy coating, like the, the 
the leaf miners, and everything else. Then you have your rasping, your intermediates, the thrips. It's not thrip, it's thrips. I got told by the entomologist down in Corpus when I first started, don't you ever say thrip thrip around me? <laughs> like, yeah! I was like, yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> so thrips, uh, there's a there's one that's really neat that's called a Cuban laurel thrip. They affect um, a certain type of tree, ficus trek trees. And I never forget, my mother-in-law lived out on the island, Potter Island. In Corpus, uh, Flower Boy, you know, Potter Island. And uh, she said, Yeah, the it's not looking right. And I was like, Okay, so leaves were curling. I could see little dots and everything else. And I said, Well, I wonder if I shake it. And I did. And I went, Dummy. <laughs> I had Cuban laurel thrips crawling all over me. And, uh, yeah, I went and jumped in the pool right after that. So, um, but, you know, they, they get in their flower thrips as well. Uh, that was something that when we when I was in Hawaii, we would inspect for for any of the cut flower industry. They would bring that people would take cut flowers with them. So they'd bring us a box that had to remain open. Okay, this is USDA plant protection quarantine. You had to have their flower that inspected by an officer. Okay. So the plant cops. <laughs> I always laughed at that job, but it was a really good job. That's where I kind of got my start with entomology or at least learning how to look at things because one of the officers, I was a part-time employee and I got, I kept getting rehired for years. They, they would call me at, you know, three in the morning and say, Hey, can you be here at 4 30? Yep. Yeah. So I, I love that job and we would intersect an insect inter intercept insects sometimes and we collect them and then send them off to the actual federal entomologist for identification. We would put what we think it was and what our best, you know, deal was, and then they would send it back whether you got it or not. Well, I think out of about 30, I think I got 10. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, this, this is nuts. Because, and they would tell you why. Uh, the, you know, the antenna on this insect is L-shaped. It had 13 joints, not 10. <laughs> Yeah, there's ants, and the difference between ants and termites, okay? Ants have a crooked shape, termites are straight, or curved, but still straight. And then the way you differentiate between some of the ants but through their antenna is the number of bulbs on their antenna. Yeah, it gets, yeah. <laughs> So, um, typically with any of your uh, intermediate type insects, you know, they're going to be, um, they're going to cause issues as far as like yellowing of the leaves. They're going to cause uh, maybe even symptoms of maybe drought stress. Maybe they're going to look like, ooh, you know, I need water uh, because they're feeding so heavily on them. They're going to damage, like I said, flower threads. They damage the flowers. You have flowers that just are deformed because of it. Typically they get in there. They're, they typically attack as the flower is forming and sting and, and get, get stuff in there. And that's what he makes the deformity. Kind of like uh, sting bugs or uh, leaf footed bugs on tomatoes. They get in there, they hit the tomato, and the next thing you know, you got this green spot. Everything else is red, but you get this green hard spot in there because that's where they stung the plant. Um, spider mites, that's a, one of those ones where you, you basically, um, typically what you'll do is see with spider mites is some webbing, real fine, silky type webbing, and then, uh, for sure, a little bitty red thing, a little bitty orangey red thing, and what you have to do is kind of beat them up against like a white sheet of paper, and then you'll see them running around. So spider mites are, you know, happen most especially vegetable crops as well, um, but there's like, Italian cypress, they get infested. How many of you have Italian cypress? No? Good. I won't tell you to cut them down. So, so there's, 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 there's certain plants that we just don't need. And that's one of them because they're so finicky with water and they're so finicky with spider mites. They just, they cause problems all the time. Everybody that has them, they are treating them every year at a certain time with a systemic insecticide to control the spider mites. And they're having to redo the soil all the time to allow drainage, but they're having to water a lot just to keep them wet. Because if they get too wet, they 
Yeah, they are. Yeah. They're, they're just finicky. Uh, so like I said, spider mite injury, uh, you'll have typically leaf formation, uh, leaf malformities. Uh, sometimes with, uh, when spider mites attack when they're very, the leaves are very young, you'll get cupping effects or dimpling effects, especially uh, on the leaves. So there's a stippling as well. So kind of a modeled look to the leaf as well. That, that's kind of what it works. So then you have your sucking mouth parts. So typically your plant bugs, um, lace bugs as well. And then your stinking leaf for the bugs. So you can kind of see right there, there's that. Heck, I got them. So yeah, the stink bugs and leaf footed bugs. Now, leaf footed bugs, of course, have on their back hind feet, they have what looks like a leaf on their, their hind foot. Okay. And then there are assassin bugs that yes. are kind of in the same family. They look very similar. But they, you can see the, like the proboscis, the, the, the mouth part actually tucks up underneath this one, red and black. And there's something that's very close. In, in, in fact, there is a one that's close to looking like that as a juvenile, but turns into a synopsis. Mm. You know what that is? I said no. Yes, you know, they're they're tiny, look like that, but then they turn different. Yeah, they're, they're different. They look similar to that, but you have you, the only way you can really tell is because the antennae and the proboscis. The synos bug is actually what causes, causes chagas disease. So they're and, nah. <laughs> chagas disease, the synos, C-E-N-O-S-E. C-E-N-O-S-E. The chagas disease, in fact, one of my first phone calls when I got into extension was a gentleman that lost a dog because of chagas disease. And these insects love to hang around dead wood, cut wood and hide in the cracks and stuff like that. Yeah, you're all are looking at them. I don't want to take this out. Uh, they come up, and, and in fact, they're, they come from South America, so they, they come up, up, up that way. Some of the documentation says these guys, migrants come and everything, they bring them with them or you know, something like that. But I can tell you working with USDA, you know, the only bound, I mean, you know, there's just no boundaries. I'm sorry. You can call it a river as a boundary, but it's not. It just takes one good Full gust of wind to throw them 60 miles up north. It's it's crazy. Um, things move. So that's one of the insects that you have to be careful of. And there's another one. Mexican kissing bug. Yes, that's exactly. That's, that's it. The yes. Oh, okay. That's it. Mexican that's kissing bug. They okay. also call kissing bug. Yeah. So there are several different names for some of these. Some of the most most common names. I like plants. If I say firecracker plant. There's several that are called firecracker plants. So same thing with some of the insects. See, but the most common thing that we have is the leaf-footed. The leaf-footed bugs, bugs, yeah. So yeah. And, and with those yeah. insects, they have a lot, ton of babies at one time. So a lot of times the, the tomato farmers, they get the to people, well, tomato yeah. farmers, but tomato growers, they get ticked off because these are hard to control. Yeah. Well, I, I put seven dust out, and there's still more of them. Well, that's because of the generations. There's multiple generations. They're, they're, they're making more, just as you speak. And they're always moving, so they're flying in. Um, one of them, um, Dr. Roy Parker, who's our come down in Corpus, was talking about it one time. He said, you know, you can control what's there. The problem is, 10 minutes later, some new ones come in. So, you know, track crops, that's one way to alleviate some of the problem, um, or just constant treatment, or... Also, what happens, especially with vegetable crops or any kind of row crop, especially, change your planting days where you alternate, like, you know, plant one week, two weeks later, plant another round. Sometimes certain vegetables are more susceptible to a specific time frame. So by planting in stages, you actually alleviate some of the insect part and disease issues. And it's squash. Huh? Squash. 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 Now, squash vine borer is a pain in the rear. We actually did a research project at least Mary Decker did the research project project we did a set B non-treated and then a mylar. Okay. Mylar is in a reflective material. Mylar as a mulch. Mylar worked just as good and not better than everything else. Some oils work for the larva. Like as a preventative. Right. But 
how much time do you have? Because <laughs> that's the thing with any organic. I, thought I was going to try to get to that earlier. You know, any organic or natural type treatment, how much time and effort do you have to put into putting that product out? Because they only have a lifespan. I mean, BT, as soon as it rains or you have five days of sun, you got to reapply. Yeah. So then you got to think, hold on, wait a minute. Here's the kicker. How much is that? Because it's organic and it's natural, it's going to cost you a lot more. So are there other things that are that are not, that have a little bit better longevity, or are there things that you can do in your process to alleviate those issues? Okay, That's the way you have to think about it. It's funny you said that. In ag business, we learned that or, there is organic products and everything, but organic is a marketing scheme that ag business creates. That's correct. And, uh, that, and it's, I, I did a um, a research on it to figure out what happened and where it came from. It came out of California. Again, organic farmers trying to compete with the large producers. They had 20 acres, he had 200. Well, he gets to make all his money. I can't, so I've got to do something. Well, then they start to market it that my okay. product's safer for you. The FDA I, is who approves things to be organic and non organic. Too. Yeah. So, in fact, try to get a organic certification for this. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, pretty tough. 10 years. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people that will offer organic or natural product type labels and things like that. Yeah, well, it won't take you long to get that, but you're paying for it. And it's not a true organic type situation. There. But do you look for that USDA? Yeah, it has certified. Certified. USDA yeah. certified, yeah. Yes. And, that, and that is a very stringent process. Mm -hmm. So if I have a piece of property going to buy, you have like five years, you have to document and show that nothing has been applied. Yep. Period. And it's sense So yeah. if it doesn't have a USDA certified Question. organic, yeah. qualified. Question it. Because some of those I've looked at, they allow certain things that I USDA won't. I see that. Mm -hmm. and I yes. Yes. Yeah. So, like, how, how is the agricultural sector catching up with things like, I said, like maybe enzymes or fungal spores like Bovaria? that do work because i've tried bovaria and it's like incredibly uh, yeah I mean, there are things that what you have what you have to do say i don't yeah i work for texas a and i go out to but i don't just look at their data i'm looking at all kinds of stuff you ever want to really dig into research go to google scholar oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. you can dig into whatever you want to dig in and um, the only reason why I met my, when my wife was getting her PhD, uh, a lot of times she would say, I can't get this article. I'm trying to find this article. I can't get it. I can't find it. And I was like, well, what article is it? What is the title? And I would go in and I would go through Google Scholar and I would find it and print it out for her. And she's like, oh my God, how do you find it? Yeah. You know, and it was, you know, was like, how to find it, you know? Uh, but it's all research and, and science information that's there. So research projects that people do and, and, and you know, if I want to know the effects of this on this, I mean, you can, you can look those types of things up. <clears throat> but that's the thing. I would look elsewhere and look globally. But you have to be careful, too, I think these days especially, because there's a lot of companies that are very swayed. I go back to that lady that came in and was really questioning, you know, our funding. And I was like, no, ma'am, I said, you, know, you got to understand. I get my funding from the county, and I get my funding, I get two checks a month. I get one from the county and one from the state. So I work for Montgomery County, but I also work for the state. That's the way county extension agents are funded. Uh, a very, very small, minimal portion is comes from USDA through funding. <clears throat> and every agent is funded a little differently as far as percentages they get from a county or a state. So my funding is not based on what she was thinking it was going to be based on. You know, and we went through it and I, and I started showing her, no, here's research information for this research. She actually became a master artist. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, and I gave her information. I said, look, you know, here it is. This is the real facts. The problem is <clears throat> we have marketing that occurs. Every, you notice how everything says non-GMO in it? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's research rules for more. Yeah, I consider that if, if a company puts out a new product, yeah. not necessarily <laughs> The other thing they do is ask the scientists to mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. You need, you need so, how do you know who to trust? Look 
That's a good question. <laughs> Look who funded the paper. Dig a little deeper. You know, I, I search, and the way I do my search is if, if I want to know something, I first search, uh, let's say, stinkmugs.tamu. Search. Yeah. Boom. Guess what? Everything Texas a and has about stinkmugs can be right there. I go specific. I teach y'all that. Don't I? I teach y'all how to search. I do. I hammer it to you guys because a lot of times you'll go stink bugs, eh? and then all of a sudden you get somebody's blog. And, and I've seen some of these. Oh, it, it's Facebook. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I know, I know, I know. What's this snake? Wrong. Oh, God. All the wrong answers. The one person that gets it right. It's a negative comment. Nobody likes it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried next door one time, and I said, you know, I can make a difference on next door. <laughs> they, here, something's wrong with my lawn. What is it? And I typed in, da da da, da here's the publication, da da da, da. Ten other comments were like, no, that's not it. It's this. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Uh, you leave? I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I'm off. Yeah. No oh. yeah. And then... I do have master gardeners that will actually go, call the extension office, call the extension office, call the extension office. Yeah. They will be able to help you. I mean, it's just, you know, those type of things. Everyone's an expert. <laughs> Everybody's an expert. And we all can be to some degree. And it's like me, you know, submitting all those samples and everything to USDA, you know, they're entomologists and I'm going, hey, I'm right, man. I'm, oh, man, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got better, but, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, we can all be trained in some way, shape, or form. Do you want to be an expert in that field? It just depends. I want to know what the main insects are so I can help people control them in a safe way. Don't. Right. Let's talk about Roundup. That's another one. Don't. I know products 100 times worse than that. Okay? Don't drink in it. Don't drink it. Don't bathe in it. Don't swim in it. And follow the dang label instructions. Yeah. Yeah. It's simple. People forget that's the law. That's you have to read. The them. label is the law. Period. And, and that's the thing is that we have these things that occur like this. Oh, you know, you, it's, it's, I don't know what the real story is behind all that. And it ain't for you. Basically, three guys sat in a room and said, who are we going after and what? Now they're going after Paraquat, another product. They're trying to knock people down that have these big products that are so so widely used. I get it. Here's something you don't know. Roundup is broken down by sunlight. It becomes inactive. And one way reason why I know that is because years ago when I was in the Oasis camp, one of my master gardeners was also my secretary at the time. I said, hey, Mark, I'm using Roundup and it's not working. I was like, what do you mean? She said, it's been 14 days. I did nothing. I was like, you know what? Call the company. Check the, the – there's a number on it. You'll have to give them a number and everything. They backtracked it. There was two vats of Roundup glyphosate that got moved out of the warehouse in the sunlight for a period of two hours and moved back in so they had a bottle and active. They gave her a free bottle. I mean, they sent her another bottle of it. But it got deactivated. Wow. Imagine that. So it's interesting – now, there's other things involved in that that we need to look deeper into. What are these inert ingredients? Yeah. So, you know, it, but that goes with every chemical. It's not just round I, I, Let me tell you, I've seen cotton defoliants. They don't burn you. Remember that good old work stuff that used to make the bubbles? You, you know, you put the hood on it, it makes the bubbles and turns it white. They got cotton defoliants that do that. And it burns your skin. You know? So, you just, just got to be careful. We all have to be careful about what we're looking at. And trust me, I have some old stuff that um, is off the market, <laughs> like chlorine and some of these other ones. So. Um, but just, just be careful and just kind of with an open mind, look at things because they are sometimes not what they appear. Uh, I always you know, try to tell people, and, and I always like least toxic first. You know, there's a lot of products out there that are <clears throat> derivatives and maybe even man-made derivatives of some of the natural, you know, pyrethrins, you know, those types of things. Yeah. They're good products, you know, they really are. Um, you know, 
chrysanthemums, you know, crushed up chrysanthemums, stuff like that. So you get spinosa is another one that's really good. So you know, it, there's stuff out there that is at least toxic. Sometimes just the squish method works. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, it's great. Crepe myrtle aphids. Uh, everybody know, want to know, always wants to know, why is my crepe myrtle turning black? What do I spray it with? The insects are already gone. Okay. We're dealing with a secondary injury or a secondary symptom. Power washable. Power washable, yeah. Now, now we have crepe myrtle bark scale, which is a really pretty nasty little insect that, that really affects yeah. them. But um, you'll get the black city mold. Okay. Well, there are a bunch of uh, ladybugs. Right. Yeah, I mean, see, that, that's the thing. Ladybug. You, you get lady. rid of the tree, right? You will. That's <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the fly away. The ladybug releases always crack me up because we're going to release them and then they all go. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. Gone. Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're I, I just, I love them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so you have crepe myrtles, crepe myrtle life is a crepe myrtle bark scale. So there's some new things that are kind of coming through. They've done some research. Um, right now, we're having actually uh, getting a lot of phone calls with, uh, hey, the crepe myrtle, my crepe myrtle is dead. What? Yeah. Well, a couple of things that we can kind of deduct. In fact, Skip and I were talking about it. I said, here's my theory. So we had the freeze 21, the big old honking freeze, okay? Not a huge impact, but especially on those because they do go dormant, but still had some impact. Then we had the December freeze this last year. The drought. We had mild conditions followed by a real heavy freeze. So there was still nutrient and water in the system of that plant, and then it froze. So most of the stuff that we saw that froze during the heavy freeze, the next year we saw them split open and things like that. So I think they were just negatively affected by that little freeze because they still had stuff in their system being a mild winter, you know, month for months. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of what's happening there. That's what we can at least tell. Uh, crepe myrtle bark scale, it, it's something that we, we've dealt with and we're looking at. They use a lot of systemic insecticides with it. There are also some pyrethrins and sprays that they can use as a combination. A lot of times they tell you to put, you know, like horticulture oil or something like that on it. You have to be careful because dormant oils, you don't want to put on something when it's hot. Dormant oils typically will burn the plant, especially when it gets too hot. In fact, a lot of the products are there's weed control products that I, I preach and teach about a lot. Read the dang label because it says if you apply this at temperatures above 85 degrees, it will burn your lawn. And I've, I've even got a picture of a guy that put a weed and product out on his lawn. Yeah, his whole yard died. <laughs> well, number one, Whoever he talked to at the box store sold him the one for Bermuda grass, not St. Augustine. Oh. <laughs> Read the label. Did start to? Huh? Did his bush start I know, to? right? I actually had a little run in with some weed and feed one time. Somebody gave me a little jagger left over. And I was just attacking an area right between me and my neighbor with no root systems, just a dead area. You know, just grass. And I was just kind of given a buffer. And I just had like a little bit left over and I just I was hot, wouldn't thinking. I had a little hand roll spreader and I went like this. Hmm. Threw it right into a blue flamingo. Oh. In wind. <laughs> Rain later that afternoon, a couple weeks, you know, like a couple of days later, it started to. Mm. And then it would kind of come back a little bit once it dried out and then when it rained again, it. Mm. Like, oh, man. Ended up losing it. So, you know, learned my lesson there. The next time I had my head not so far at my keister. All right, so the great little March scale, that's one of those uh, that's kind of bad. Like I said, it, it's something that's a, in fact, all the southern states, it's a, there's a, like a $6 million grant project that they're using to study this. Uh, we had, um, her name was Meng Meng Gu. She was actually studying this project and got it initiated and everything else. And then she actually moved up and went to uh, Colorado. She took a new position. So I don't know who's working on it now, but they're still studying it. Um, mealybugs. Uh, those are those are quite honestly can be a little bit of a pest. There's a high, pink hibiscus mealy bug that affects the hibiscus that's specific to hibiscus, and basically they are kind of pinkish colored. Uh, they're very hard to control, but you, and it's one of those things, even with not, uh, synthetic products, you have to stay resilient with them. And a lot of the products, too, you, you need to alternate. Don't just keep using the same thing over and over again because it'll build resistance right. in the insects. Uh, what works on mealybugs? Peppermint, 
still soaked in water. Mm -hmm. Government make that still soap and water. Yeah, so it works really yeah. wonders. Oh yeah, for in fact, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of soaps and everything that work real well. It's mm -hmm. The steam, it, it, it provides the steam. In fact, a lot of the products uh, for insects, like uh, for controlling ants, they use like a citrus oil. Yeah, it works on ants too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Problem is with ants is once you treat a mound, then they just go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And there's well, I mean, like inside the house, yeah. Yeah. like sugar yeah. ants and stuff. Deliming them. That's what they have to do. So, you know, piercing and sucking insects, a lot of times you'll have these insects, you know, meaty bugs and aphids and things like that, they'll get in such large numbers, that actually cause wilting of the plant. Uh, if, you're, if you're not paying attention, you think, oh, it's water issue, but it could actually be uh, insects. And they love a greenhouse. They, yes, they do. They do. That's, and that's where we use sticky traps, just to try to keep, you know, keep and monitor, because once they start getting out of hand, then we need to control them. So, mm -hmm. uh, all right, so let's see. Uh, gall forming insects, we have a lot of you know, oak galls yeah. and things like that. There's smooth oak galls, fuzzy oak galls, leaf galls, so a lot of insects of that nature. Uh, some of them are actually beneficial insects. They'll actually parasitize other, other insects that are especially larvae. <clears throat> now they can, most of the gall forming insects are found in oak trees. They're not harmful to the tree unless they reach extreme populations which can happen. And what you'll have is a small branch, you know, it's like about as big as a pencil and all of a sudden it's got this big warp, you know, uh, but you'll actually see the holes in it and everything else. Uh, but there's a lot of bark, uh, there's bark lice. This is the beneficial. A lot of times when people see this pantyhose webbing on the branches, they freak out. Something's eating my tree and they go out and spray it. We had somebody call and apologize that they had killed all the bark lice. They didn't realize they were beneficial. Um, then you have the giant bark, you know, uh, bark aphids uh, that can occur as well. But typically, what they're doing is they're actually cleansing the bark lice, they're cleansing the tree fungus. Of, uh, a fungus. a fungus or uh, lichen, uh, oh, okay. yeah, uh, algae type. So cleaning it. And the biggest thing is, you know, scouting and monitoring, you know, making sure you're paying attention to what's going on. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there. This is an old standby. Uh, probably every county extension agent has that in their office. Um, I use it quite often just to look at the common ones. But I mean, I've been doing this for 22 years. I've been in extension now, plus my six years that I was with the USDA. So there's a lot of things that just just come right off the top of my tongue, so to speak. Of course, as I get older, I think the Alzheimer's just kicking in. It's good. <laughs> or the Rolodex is just slow because I sometimes I sit there and I look at something and I go oh. <laughs> it'll come eventually but that is a good resource and of course now in the day and age with everything that's online there's so many good resources out there I know they all have the iNaturalist um, you know texasinsects.timber.edu uh, their bugguide.net is another one uh, there's all just all kinds of plant identification Google Lens Okay. Now, sometimes like plant.net, I use that one for plants, plant.net. Sometimes good, sometimes crap. <laughs> It'll get you close. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing is I, I dig deeper and go, yeah, that's not quite it, but it's fine. That same family. And then I start digging a little deeper and I find it. Um, sometimes it'll get you close enough to where you can figure out what it is. Um, there's Texas High Plains insects and there's a whole bunch of different ones in there. Uh, ask the entomologist.tamu.edu. That, that one is good. And like I said, uh, insect images. Uh, a lot of times, if you kind of know about what it is or close to what it's going to be, you know, if it is a stink bug of some type, you can go and put, you know, stink bugs in Texas. It kind of narrow things down. Stink bugs in South Texas. Stink bugs, stink bugs affecting this. You know, then you can really get a little bit more refined. Um, I use the bugguide.net. Bugguide.net. This one right here is really good. I, I, yeah, there's a lot of times where I go through there. I, my wife always says, you stop chasing squirrels, but that's what happens is I go down that rabbit hole and I start getting, you know, trying to hone in on something. And uh, sometimes it'll take me three or four days and I'll spend an hour or two here and there digging deeper you know getting it more refined and then oh now I know exactly what it is and you know, how to turn everything 
something else. But um, uh, for instance, I, I was in Corpus, and this guy told me that there's this big hole right next to his palm tree, and his palm tree all of a sudden died. I was like, okay. He said, it's this big beetle. I was like, what do you mean big beetle? Couldn't figure it out. We brought it over to my house, and it is a huge beetle. It's about yay big around, and about that long. He ran over it with his truck, and it didn't do anything. Oh, he's in an F-250. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the big old type of beetle that goes and bores a hole right next to the palm tree and goes right up through the heart of it and kills him. Boom. Came in on plants from a nursery uh, out of Florida, which is most stuff we get from Florida. Anyway. Florida, yeah, Florida just seems to be like yeah. all these oh yeah, the yeah. Asian cycad scale, that um, mm -hmm. great little bark scale. I mean, a lot of stuff that we end up getting from that industry over there. But bugguy.net is a really good one. So, um, you know, you can do searches and image searches. You know, go through Google. You at least kind of know, you know, worms of Texas, worms affecting this, worms whatever in Texas, the southeast Texas. You can kind of do the same thing with weeds and plants. You can kind of do the same thing. I like kind of, I kind of chase squirrels and do a whole bunch of different ones. And I'll have like six tabs opened up, and I'm doing all of them at the same time, trying to narrow it down. So um, I kind of get that way. The Ento department at the uh, University of Florida also is a good one as well. Uh, lots of good fact sheets. If you ever want, you know, fact sheets about an insect, if you know what the insect is, just type in a .tamu at the end of your search, or a .edu for education. Okay, those are research-based stuff, not somebody's MySpace or, you know, stuff like that off, you know, that. So there's good information out there. You just have to know how to look for it and where to look for it. So, um, uh, University of uh, 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 California, UC Davis is a good website as well. They have a lot of natural controls. They don't really get into, um, they're not one to really get into specific treatments for insects or anything like that. So um, anyway, UC Davis, just some of the resources and everything. You go through and you, you know, uh, we have a problem solver through a &M for diseases and insects. You go tomato problem solver .tamu, it'll flow up a problem solver. You can look at leaf damage, if it's a disease or what's this, if it's a damage to the tomato itself, what is it? So uh, digital microscope, Skip, Skip does a great job at this. He always has like a little microscope that he clips onto his phone and he takes really good images of stuff it really helps him out you, know, you can get as far as close i mean that's a penny you can get that close up to something <clears throat> um he, he does a really good job with it see there's a back picture of it he has a little video there of it moving around and then he goes with his lens it's like a little thing that just mm -hmm. pops right in there huh? yeah and then um well, like I mean, in our office, I, I've got microscopes there, so I actually I pull up my microscopes and look at stuff all the time. Um, but anyway, that's it. I kind of help you out as far as getting basics. Yeah. And, uh, these are pretty good. These little jewelers loops. You can buy them on Amazon for about ten bucks a piece or something like that. Um, they're they're good. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.